Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, SciPy Psychic Image tutorial. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'd like to introduce the team is going to present today. So it's myself, Stefan van der Waal. Um, we've got Juan Nunez Iglesias and uh, Josh Warner over there. So yeah, we're very excited to be here with you this afternoon um, and to share um, an overview, an intermediary overview of uh, Scikit Image. Uh, this tutorial is going to happen inside of a Jupyter Notebook, and ideally you would all be able to follow along. So we sent some instructions out beforehand. Those are the instructions uh, linked to on the board. Um, if you have any problem getting your um, own setup working, please raise your hand and someone will come and uh, give you a hand. So Scikit Image is an image processing library for uh, Python, and it is meant to be easy to use, easy to understand, um, well documented, and Pythonic. So the idea is that you don't have to deal with um, strange, uh, you know, libraries wrap, C libraries wrapped into Python with foreign interfaces. These things should really feel like, um, like a good Python library, um, and it should be discoverable. Um, and easy to apply uh, to your problem. Um, this is a community developed project, so all of the work you see on this project is, um, is volunteer based. For today, you'll need to have some understanding of NumPy, SciPy, and Matplotlib, but we'll try and give you um, a brief overview of all of the tools uh, you need as we go along. So we'll uh, we'll kick off uh, with an overview of um, of NumPy arrays, the container that we use for representing images, and we'll show you how those get ingested, displayed, etc., inside of Scikit Image. Then we'll take two um, sub packages of Scikit Image that are commonly used: filters and segmentation. We'll treat those. Um, then I'll give you an, out, an overview of an example from a real-world paper so you can see what, a, what an actual pipeline looks like. Um, and then Josh will end with, a, with a, just a, an, um, an overview of the library, the bigger perspective overview of the library. Um, and they note that there will be snacks and coffee available during the tutorial. We listed the times there as well. We're handing out sticky notes, so uh, please grab one of each color when it passes by. The idea is that you have a red sticky that you can put on your laptop to show when you need assistance, and a blue one to show when you're done with an exercise. <coughs> okay, any questions about the tutorial or the material uh, before we kick off? Great. Right, so for those of you who don't have um, Jupyter instances up and running already, so you, um, you clone the, the source repository, or you can go to GitHub to this URL, download the material, unzip it, um, and then you go into that directory and you type Jupyter Notebook, and that should fire up your browser with the, um, with the notebook. You should see... Um, you should see something like this and then just navigate to workshops, 2019 SciPy, and open the index file. And that's where I just started off. Okay, can I get a, uh, just a show of hands? Who's able to navigate to this page? Okay, fantastic. If you have any issues, again, just raise your hand and someone will come out to help you. All right, so I'm going to enter this first uh, lecture, Images as NumPy Arrays now. All right, so I'm, I'm just going to, um, the, the first cell you see here is just to set up the, the plotting so that you get um, nice images displayed inside of your notebook so they don't pop out outside of the notebook. So I'm going to execute that and then we can kick off. All right, so inside of Scikit Image, we don't have special containers for uh, handling images. So there's no image class. All the data that goes in um, 
uh, are represented as NumPy arrays. Um, it's the standard exchange format for uh, array data inside the scientific Python ecosystem. This allows us to have good interoperation with other libraries like OpenCV, Matplotlib, and so forth. So the simplest image you can make is a two-dimensional matrix. In this case, I'm going to generate a matrix, a 500 by 500 matrix of random values. So you can see I import NumPy. Um, I import matplotlib, which I'm going to use to display the image, and then I use this numpy random call to generate a 500 by 500 matrix of random values between 0 and 1. Right. And there I send that to matplotlib, and matplotlib quite happily displays it. And you'll see that values of 0 map to black, and values of 1 map to white, as you would expect. This also holds for real-world images. So um, I'm importing here from scikit image. I'm importing the data submodule. That's where we store um, example data sets. And then I'm asking for the, the coin data set. And then I'm just investigating um, that object, that image object. What is its type? What's its um, data type? And what's its shape? So let's look. So right. So there's the image of the coins displayed. And you'll see that, yep, this is just a standard NumPy array. Um, it's got a data type of uint8, which means it's an unsigned integer that runs between 0 and 255. So in this case, 0 maps to black. 255, which is the maximum value that can be represented in that array, maps to white. And then the shape of this array, 300 rows and 380 uh, columns. Now, if this is how you represent a gray level array, how do you think we would represent color arrays? What would we need in order to represent a color image? Yes, yes, yeah, so I, uh, I hear red, green, and blue. So that's one common way of representing data. There are other ways, like you could store U, saturation, and value, or I mean, there are several ways to decompose an image, but the most common one is to have a red band, a green band, and a blue band. So you would expect for a standard color image to have a number of rows, a number of columns, and then to have three layers, red, green, and blue. So here again, I'm going to use the data submodule, and I'm going to um, grab Chelsea, a photo of my cat. And you'll see this photo, um, 300 rows, 450 columns, 451 columns, and then these three layers that we spoke about. First one red, second one green, third one blue. Um, and in this case, because the data type is, again, um, unsigned integers, it runs between 0 and 255. Right, so these are standard NumPy arrays, right? Nothing fancy. We don't do anything strange with them. So you can manipulate these arrays just like you would any standard NumPy array. So here I'm doing a slicing operation on the array, and then I'm assigning values into the array. So let's see. Uh, what do we expect line 1 to do over here? Well, um, it slices from row 10 to 110, so that gives us a band in the image. And then in that band, it slices out columns 10 to 110, so now we have a block. Um, and then the colon there in the last indexing position means grab the R, the G, and the B value, red, green, and blue, and assign it the values 255, 0, and 0. So that's going to be bright red. And indeed, when we manipulate the array and we display it, we see, yep, there's a red block. If you need to represent transparent areas in your um, image, you can add a fourth layer. So then you had, have red, green, blue, and an alpha layer. And the alpha could represent um, transparency. You could go further. So this little table summarizes um, from least to most complex the, the types of images that you can represent. So we started off with 2D gray level. Then we went to um, 2D multi-channel, so multi-channel being red, green, and blue. Or maybe if you have an, a satellite image, that might be red, green, blue, blue infrared, you know, a whole bunch of other filters. Um, you can also have volumetric data. So that's where you have an X, Y, and a Z axis. So you've got a volume of data that you might want to, um, you know, rotate, look at, segment. Um, and then you can have the same kind of data, but with multiple channels, so volumetric data that may be scanned with different filters or from different wavelengths. <coughs> right, so let's uh, 
we've, we've already seen now that matplotlib can display these images, but let's dig into that a little bit more carefully. So again, from the data module, I'm going to grab Chelsea the cat and a rocket. And I'm just going to execute this piece of code over here. I know there's a lot going on there, but let's execute it. We'll see what it does, and then I'll go back and ex explain uh, line by line. All right. So we see here that we've got two panels, each with an image in it. And then in the rocket image, you see two vertical um, lines appearing, as well as a dashed white line. And in the top corner, you see a legend. Um, so let's see, how did we generate that plot? Well, the first thing we asked matplotlib to do is create a grid of subplots for us. In this case, a grid of one by two, so one row, two columns. Um, I specified the figure size. Sometimes you want to make the, the figure a little bit bigger or smaller. Um, then subplots returns the figure itself, as well as the two axes that I asked for. So the axes are the actual regions that we're going to draw in. So you've got these two axes. On the first axis, I'm calling mshow with my first image. And then on the second axis here in line 9, I'm doing mshow with the second image. For the first axis, I'm setting the title to cat. Um, and I'm switching off the axis. So you lose the tick marks on the edges. Uh, for the second one, I set the title. And I then I set the x label to uh, launching position alpha equal uh, 320. And then I use the vlines command to plot these two vertical lines. And I just call a plot command to draw some other line uh, on top of the rocket image. And then finally, I call legend. Legend, when you look inside of, uh, of these calls, you'll see that there's a label attached to each one. So legend takes those labels and it displays them as a legend. All right, any questions about how to visualize images with matplotlib or anything you saw here that looks kind of funny? All good? All right. So that's basically all you need to know about matplotlib for today. So let's continue looking at images as NumPy arrays. So we, uh, we mentioned that an image can run, for example, from 0 to 255 if it is an unsigned uh, integer. Um, but we also, the first example we generated was an image that ran from 0 to 1. And somehow those both came out as images. So how does that work? Well, so a NumPy array has a data type associated with it. And the data type determines the range that we're going to expect inside of scikit-image. So if you have a floating point image, we're going to expect the values to range between 0 and 1 gradually. If you have an unsigned integer, uh, of 8 bits that runs between 0 and 255, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Um, you can have images with, uh, with a bigger integer range, or you can have images that go negative and positive. Um, but these are the two most common cases that you'll see, a floating point or uh, uint8 images that run from 0 to 255. And you can see that these things are basically equivalent. So I'm going to generate two of those images. The first one, I'm calling NumPy's linspace command to give me regularly uh, spaced data between 0 and 1. The second one, I'm doing the same, but between 0 and 255. And in the second case, I'm setting the data type to uint8. And I want to show you that those two images, when I display them, they get basically the same thing out. So there you see. First image is float64, goes from 0 to 1. Second image is uint8, goes from 0 to 255 but matplotlib displays them both correctly, right? So how do you know what to send into any specific scikit-image function? Do you have to convert your data to floating point or integer? No, you don't have to worry about any of that. Um, the functions are written that they accept a f uh, an image with any data type, and then it will process it, and it would, will return the image with the most convenient uh, data type for that function. This means that you can string functions together in a pipeline, and you never need to worry about the data types in the middle. You just make sure that whatever goes in has the correct range, and then whatever comes out will have the correct range too. If you explicitly want to convert between these formats, we have utility functions images float um, and images ubyte. Ubyte is the same as uint8, so then you can use that to jump between the different representations. 
All right. Of course, we, we don't want to just operate uh, on images that live inside of our example data module. You'd prefer maybe to load some images from TIFF or PNG or JPEG or whatever format you have at hand. Um, since we're only operating on NumPy arrays, you can use any library to load that data. As long as it conforms to the, the correct range and data type, you can uh, generate that NumPy array however you like. Um, common libraries used for reading images would include ImageIO, Matplotlib, Pillow. We've built wrappers around these so you don't have to worry about what's installed in your system. So we have this IO submodule, so you can do from SK image, import IO, then you call io.imread and you give it the file name and things should just work. So in this case, you'll see I load this balloon image. Um, the image is a NumPy ND array. Data type is uint8, so the values go from 0 to 255, and because it's a color image, we have three dimensions here. Rows, columns, and the three layers. We also have the facility to load multiple images if you want to, so that's called an image collection. So an image collection you use very much like a, like a normal Python list. You can iterate over it, you can slice into it, um, so to, and to construct it, you just call it with um, with a pattern. So you can, for example, say, give me all the um, PNG files in a certain directory, um, or give me all the PNGs and all the JPEGs, and it will grab all of those for you. It doesn't actually load them all into memory, because if you then call this command on 20,000 images, your you know, memory will decline rapidly. Um, so it loads them on demand as you as you request them or as you use them. Uh, okay, this piece of code, you don't have to look at it in detail, it just it trades over the image collection um, to, and it plots that image collection. So you can see those are all the images that um, were loaded from disk. Because we use enumerate several times in this tutorial, I think um, it's just worth quickly um, reminding everyone what that does. So when you have a list like animals, um, in this case I have cat, dog, and leopard, if you call enumerate on animals, what does it give me? It gives me the number zero and cat, because cat is in the zeroth position. So zero cat, one dog, two leopard. So it generates the index as well as the element. So it's a very convenient way to iterate over a list so you get both the index and the actual item. All right, so that's basically all you need to know about uh, NumPy arrays and how they are used for uh, representing images. We're now going to switch over into interactive mode. Um, I've, I've put down three exercises here. So the first exercise is to draw the letter H on top of an image. So we provide you with an image, and your job is to write a little function that manipulates that NumPy array so that the letter H appears on it. In the second exercise, we load an image, and then your job is to look at the red, the green, and the blue channels, split them apart, display them separately, and see how they differ and explain why they differ. And then in the, um, in the final example, um, we show you the formula for converting from grayscale, um, from a color image to grayscale. So I think most of us, when we start with image processing, you think, well, when you want to convert from color to gray, you just average all the color bands together. So a third times the red plus a third times the green plus a third times the blue. But it turns out because your eye is so much more sensitive to green, you have to weigh the green layer more heavily than you weigh um, the blue, which our eyes notice much less of. So um, in this example, you are asked to combine these layers with the correct weights to convert an image from uh, color to gray. All right, so um, let's see how that goes. And uh, so all sticky notes are off. Um, write sticky notes when you need help or raise your hand. And we've got three people in the room who can, um, four people in the room who can give you a hand. All right, shall we look at the solution to these? 
Um, how many of you got the first one done? Working? OK, great. That's awesome. Um, all right, so you start off with, um, so you draw H gets an image as input. That's uh, an, an RGB image. It will be n by n by 3. Um, you get the coordinates, so that's the offset where you want to draw the H. Um, and then you got the color. So you start off by making a copy of the image, because otherwise, remember that NumPy arrays get modified in place. So if you just take the input, modify it, send it out to the user, then you've modified their original data, which is certainly mostly not what they want. Um, so let's see. So I'm going to grab a little area. How big do they say this thing needs to be? Twenty-four by twenty-four. Yep, uh, twenty-four by twenty. Okay, so let's grab row to row plus twenty-four, and we grab column to column plus twenty. Okay, so now I've selected a small sub area of my image. Um, in NumPy, we call this a view, right? So you get a, a view onto your original array, and you can go and modify that. So we'll say, um, take the first three columns and set it to, to color, and take the first, um, the last three columns. Oh, uh, these are rows. Row, column, color. Row, column, color. So take the last three columns and set them to color. And hmm? the, yeah, don't, don't correct me if I make mistakes. I need to learn. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, but I don't think uh, you're correct. Um, we'll see. I, I might swallow my words soon enough. So, and then the middle bar uh, will be around what's this thing's height? Twenty-four. So it'll be around you know eleven to thirteen or something. And we'll set that one to color. OK. So there's my function. And when I execute it, nothing happens. It should be out. It should be out. No, this should be, yeah, this should be out. There we go. There we go. OK, so there's a little. Does that look right? Yes. Yeah. All right, there are obviously many ways to do this. You could also just index directly into the image. Then you have to do uh, a few more calculations to figure out the exact offsets and so forth, uh, whatever works. OK, any questions about that one? So when you're assigning H in this case, hmm. you're not like parsing out, like taking a section of out and making that H? Just... Yeah, so in NumPy, when you do something like, let's say, X is NP array 1, 2, 3, and then I do something like y equals the first two elements of x. Then if I go uh, y naught equals 10, and I do print x and print y, what do you think the value of x is going to be? It's going to get modified. Yeah, because in NumPy, you get views onto the other array unless you request an explicit copy. And this is an important part of the NumPy design. It means that. You don't, if you have a, a two gigabyte image in memory and you point another variable to it, you don't suddenly have four gigabytes of imaging data in memory. Okay, so for the second one, I asked you to uh, pull apart the different color layers of the image. So the red one is image rows, columns, zero, zero for um, red. You could also, instead of typing two colons, you can just type dot, dot, dot. That's NumPy syntax for take whatever slices you have to until you get to this one. And then in the last position, you put a one and then a two. All right, so we execute that. So here we get red, green, blue, and all the channels um, recombined. The interesting thing you see here is that the, um, the bushes have a very low blue channel. 
right? Because that's mainly like greens and reds. It's like an orangey kind of bush. Um, in the sand, the sand is also more yellowy, so you don't get very much blue. The sea is quite blue, so the blue is bright, but it's also a bit green, um, but it's not very red. So then we have this artificial We have this artificial image, and the question is, if these were red, green, and blue layers, what would their combination look like? Well, we're painting with light here, so you would expect re red and green to add up to? What? Red and green and blue should to bring you to white. Red and green, well, well let's see. Um, we can do a D stack of red, green, blue. So, yeah, so then you see that red and green together gives you yellow, blue and red gives you purple, and so forth. Instead of dstack, you could also have done np.stack and provide access equal to 2. Okay, and then finally, there's this convert um, an, a color image to, to gray. So, how are we going to do that? We want our weights in there somehow, so let's see. 0 0.2126, 0 0.7152, and 0 0.0722. Then we want to multiply, so that's a row vector, and we want to multiply that with our image. And our image is that. So we might need a transpose in there somewhere. Let's see, yeah, it doesn't like that. Um, where does the transpose sit? I can just swap them. Yeah, that's the easiest. Yeah. So there you see, if you weigh the red, green, the blue channels with those correct weights, then you get the same, same as RGB to gray. Uh, what happens if we use a third, a third, a third? The, that's sort of the intuitive thing to do, right? Well, you see the... It looks quite a bit different. Over here, it's much lighter than in the actual RGB to gray. OK. Um, any questions about any of these exercises? Could you please go to this code exercise where you converted everything to red in the previous one? Again? Previous exercise. Was, it, was there a question here that I missed? Oh, no, I think in this example, I just want to show you what happens when you combine red, green, and blue. I wanted you to see that you get this out. So you can see how the um, individual layers combine into a, a color image. All right. Okay, so next up, where did Juan go? Restroom. Ah. All right. I guess he's going to want to plug in. All right, we'll take five minutes uh, until one's back, and then we'll continue. All right, let's get started. Um, so as Stefan said, I'm Juan Nunez Iglesias, another core developer for Scikit Image. Um, so now we're going to talk about filters and image filtering. So in your index file, click on that um, link, filters. So that should open up this notebook. If it doesn't, put a red sticky on your laptop, and we'll come help you. Um, so I'm just going to close that. Oh, I can't actually. Let's see if that helps. 
That helps a little. Good. Um, okay. So um, this is just some configuration to run Matplotlib in the notebook. Um, and over here, we're just going to make sure that all of our images plot with the grayscale color map, which is a bit more natural for us. So that's just some basic settings. So <clears throat> to understand image filtering, um, I find it really useful to look at signal filtering. These are 1D signals, and then we can extend those to two dimensions and higher dimensions. Um, so let's look at a very simple signal. It's a step signal, goes from zero, goes up to one halfway through. <clears throat> so we can add some noise because real signals are rarely that nice and flat. Um, so the question is, if we have a noisy signal, how can we do something to the signal to make it less noisy? Um, so the very simplest thing that we can do is take the average of neighboring pixels. Um, and that will give us, um, hopefully you can see, something that's slightly smoother than the original um, noisy um, image. Uh, sorry, not image, signal. Um, now if we want to, so just to clarify what I'm doing here, I'm taking uh, this very long array and I take every element except the last one. I add it to every element from the second one onwards. So I'm, that means that elements are shifted by one and then I take half of that. Um, if we want to make it a little bit smoother, then it gets a little bit less nice in terms of the expression. So now you have to add three things together and divide it by three. Um, but you can see that you do get the, the orange line is smoother than the blue line. Um, and so if you want to keep smoothing more and more, then this way of doing things becomes more and more cumbersome. So is there a better way that we can use? Um, and there is. Uh, it's called uh, either cross-correlation or convolution, uh, depending on what you're talking about. And they're slightly different. And we'll see how they're different. Um, but the basic idea is let's make an array of the same size uh, as the original. And then at every position in the output array, we're going to look at the neighboring positions, and we're going to add them together um, with a, some coefficients. If it's only three, um, then we'll, the coefficients will be one third, one third, and one third. Um, but now the coefficients are going to be just an array of coefficients, and we're just going to overlay that on top of our original data, multiply all the values uh, at each position, and then sum them together to get the output value at the center position. Um, so that's what um, cross-correlation is. Convolution is the same thing, but you flip the values. So in the case of these kernels, it doesn't really matter. Um, OK, so this creates an array with three values. Uh, and those values are one third. Um, and then we run np.convolve with the noisy signal and the mean kernel. Um, and I'll tell you about the mode in a second. Um, and now we can verify that this smooth signal 3p for prime um, is the same thing as the other one. So we use the numpy function all close. Um, and you can see that they are the same thing. So rather than adding these things together by hand, doing this kind of array slicing, um, we use a call to convolve with the original array and just this array of three elements. Is that clear enough to everyone? The, yeah. Uh, the mp4 command is kind of new, so can you just print it out what it stores in, in the kernel? So, sorry, what, what? The mp4 oh, yes. Kind of yeah. Um, so yeah, if you haven't seen numpy.full, so you know, one thing that I did for years and years, if I wanted an array of all the same value, I would do numpy.1s of the size that I wanted times uh, the value that I wanted, say 8. Um, a quicker way of doing that is np.full for 8. So it's the size and then the value that you want in there. So it's the same. Well, in this case, because I had uh, 8.0, it would be that. OK. Yes. Yeah, so you can, so, so the first argument is the shape. So this could be 3, 3. Um, yeah. 
so the interface mirrors that of ones and zeros and uh, random and all of those basic NumPy array creation things. Um, yep. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes? Uh, actually, right there, you're playing with it right on it. Um, just had, oh. um, you have convolve equals mp correlate there. Is it? Convolve? Yes, yes. Uh, so I'll, I'll show that in, in the next bit. But um, convolve uh, is the exact. So correlate is you take the kernel and you place it on that position and you multiply things. Convolve is the same thing, but you flip the kernel around. No, but I, I'm just, the thing is that neural networks have changed the vocabulary, um, and, and they talk about convolutions without the flipping. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm being fast and loose with, with the terms here. Um, yeah, but that's the, that's the difference between the two things. In this case, they're actually exactly the same thing because the kernel is symmetric, so it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so I'm not going to worry too much about um, the code in here. Um, what I'm doing is for every step of that correlation, um, I'm drawing a plot, and then I'm using IPy widgets um, to make an interactive version of this so you can see the correlation happening. Um, okay, so here's my first three values, um, and this is the average of those three values, you can see. Um, so that's the very first signal, uh, the very first uh, part of the convolution, and then we just slide around to the next value, and then in the output signal we put that value. Um, and you can see that we're getting a smoother signal by following the average of those values. Okay. Does anyone see a bit of a problem with this? You're losing all your high frequency data? Oh, yes. That's a, that's a bit too advanced. <laughs> what, what I was getting at is that it, there's a lag, um, so you're 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 losing the edges of your data because you don't have three values at the edges. Um, so um, that comes in this one. Um, so so this is now a convolution with a much larger mean, mean kernel, 11, and you can see that now instead of we had 100 values, we're down to 89 because um, you trimmed the edges. Um, and if I do that same animation, it becomes a lot more obvious that you're lagging your signal quite a bit. Okay. Um, so NumPy has a fix for this, and well, general uh, filtering community has a fix for this, which is to use this mode equals same and what that's doing is it's padding your original signal so that you actually have enough values to, to take the average. Um, so if I run that, um, you can see that in the mode equals valid that we had before, you have this lag. Um, whereas in mode equals same, it's the, the, the average is centered. Um, and you can see another artifact, I hope, which is that the edges are um, sort of dropping off here. Um, any ideas why? Yeah, so, so uh, NumPy is convolve and correlate. When you do mode equals same, the pattern is, is zero, and that's the only option you have. Um, so um, I've done another um, example where I'm convolving uh, with same, so I'm doing that padding and then doing the convolution. So that's your original signal, and you can see the padding is these um, five values. And now this is the average of the things around it instead of the things in front of it. Um, and I'm just going to make this run as fast as I can. Um, so if I go here, that's you can see the average of the edge. And as soon as I start hitting it, you see the, the signal dropping off because it's taking the average of those zero values. OK, so first exercise. Um, have a look at the documentation of this function, scipy.ndimage.convolve or .correlate. As I mentioned, it doesn't matter. Uh, and then try the same convolution, but look at the arguments and see if you can uh, avoid these edge effects uh, using the ND image documentation. Um, and as before, if you need help, put a red sticky up. If you're done, put a blue sticky up.
Okay, I'm seeing a couple of blue stickies. Yes. Oh, a lot of blue stickies. Come on, guys. Got to get this. <laughs> um, so let's look for that documentation. So there's two ways to look at documentation. Uh, the slow way is Google. Um, so I can do scipy nd image. Uh, what did I say? Convolve. Um, so you click on that, and then um, there's a mode uh, keyword argument, and you can see that there's mode reflect or mode nearest, which expands the value at the edge. Um, and so any of those will end will will get rid of this problem of padding with zeros and having your signal uh, tumble. Um, wrap obviously would not. Um, so that's the. That way. The other thing, uh, if you're using IPython or Jupyter Notebook, um, then can you? There's someone with the red sticky. Um, so I can do uh, from scipy import and the image as NDI, and then NDI dot convolve question mark, and that will um, pop up the documentation for. Um, that function. Okay? That, um, it's even a little bit better than that, actually. So you can actually do open a parentheses and you can. Hmm, it's not doing anything. Uh, if you do shift tab, it gives you the signature and you can see it. Oh, that's kind of terrible. If you do shift tab tab, you get the full doc string. Uh, scrollable like that, and if you do shift tab tab tab, then it'll pop it open just like before. Okay, so all of these are nice ways when you're in uh, IPython or Jupyter to uh, look at documentation, um, very handy. Um, okay, so there's mode equals reflect, so now if I do uh, smooth NDI is uh, NDI dot convolve, um, noisy signal and mean kernel 11 and then I can add mode equals reflect and oh, plt dot plot smooth and the uh, you can see that you don't get the drop off at the end and, and you still get the padding you get that full full length signal um, as before. Okay, any questions about that? Good. All right, so now what we talked about before with Convolve and Correlate uh, is going to come into play because we're going to look at uh, something called a difference filter. So let's look at the step signal, the clean one uh, that we had before, just as an uh, illustration. Um, so we'll just gloss over this one. Um, what do you think will happen if I convolve with the kernel minus 1, 0, and 1? Does anyone have ideas? Yeah, so it, it will look at whether there's diff. So if, if you're in this part of the signal, you're going to multiply minus 1 times 0, 0 times 0, and 1 times 0, and you just get 0. So that's your output. If you're on this part of the signal, you're going to get minus 1 times 1, which is minus 1, then 0, then 1 times 1, and then when you add them together, you get 1 minus 1, and you get 0 again. And it's only when you get to the middle bit that you get the minus 1 times 0 and 1 times 1, and you end up with uh, just a value of 1 in the middle. Um, so, um, And so I'm going to show you uh, with that kernel what happens with both convolve and correlate. Um, and so you can see that the convolved gives you a negative one because the sign is flipped, and so you actually get a minus one times the one, um, and so you get a negative. And if you do correlated, um, then you get a positive one. Um, so I find it easier to think in uh, correlate, so that's what we're going to use for the rest of the lesson. But if you're from a signal processing background, then you probably want to use convolve. Um, and as we can see, they're very simply related to each other. OK. Did that make sense to everyone? Difference filter? Awesome. OK. Um, 
Now we're going to try to apply the difference filter to the noisy signal. Um, and you can see that it becomes a lot harder to see that middle edge in amongst all the noise. Um, so what people tend to do is they smooth the signal and then they do the, the edge filter. Um, and it turns out that you can do both um, in one step. You can, you can convolve the two kernels together um, and then get a smoothing average filter. Um, so let's see what happens if we do this. So you can see that you get, here's our smoothing filter from before, uh, one third, one third, one third, and here's our difference filter. And if you use this mode equals full, it actually stretches it to the minimal possible overlap between the two signals, which is one pixel. Um, so you get, um, if you put your one third way over the edge here, um, you get one third times minus one, so you get minus a third. Then you get one third times minus one plus one third times zero, which is minus a third. Then when they have full overlap, you get zero because it's one third minus one third. And then on the other side, you get the positive values. OK, so now you have this longer filter that does a little bit of smoothing. It looks for an edge between two values and another two values. Um, so, so you're going to get some averaging of, on either side, and you, you'll get some smoothing. Um, OK. So now you can see that you can pick out the, the edge over your, your original signal. Questions? No? Okay. Um, so we're going to do an exercise, uh, which is to do Gaussian smoothing combined with the edge filter. Um, so I want you to create a Gaussian um, kernel by hand, um, which is a, so Gaussian kernel, I should probably define that. Um, the average kernel takes an average of equal weight throughout your whole um, vector, or your whole set of values. A Gaussian kernel places higher weight of, on the center values, so you're, you're going to get um, closer to your original value, um, but you're still going to get some smoothing with um, sort of falling influence on, on the surrounding values. Um, and that influence is given by this equation, um, and you can use a little bit of uh, NumPy magic to get this kernel and then um, Convolve it with the difference filter, and then do find your your smooth edge. Okay, so we'll take five to ten minutes for that. Uh, and as usual, blue stickers down, and then put them back up when you're done. I'm going to give you the solution to one to begin. Um, so. Yeah, that's your x's, and if I do print x, um, that's all my values. Um, and the nice thing with NumPy is that you can just apply entire formulas to a full array. So I can do k equals, I'll call it Gaussian kernel to make it more explicit. Uh, 1 over np dot, sorry. Yeah, np dot s square root of 2 times np dot pi times sigma. And we're going to say sigma equals 1 here. So you can play with it later. And then that whole thing times np dot exp minus x squared divided by 2 times sigma squared. Hopefully that's right. And now if I do plt up plot Gaussian kernel, well, it's a bell curve. It's a very pixelated <coughs> bell, but it's a bell. All right, so that's step one. So keep going with steps two and three. So I can do Gauss diff. This is the same thing as I did up here with the mean 
3 filter, but now I'm going to correlate it with the Gaussian filter instead of the mean 3. So Gaussdiff is np.correlate no, equals np.correlate Gaussian kernel and minus 1, 0, 1 mode equals full. Okay, so now you have this um, kernel that looks for a difference um, that is average, that is present over an edge. So this is kind of like your, um, I don't know why it's flipped actually. It's probably got to do with why people use convolutions instead of correlations. <laughs> um, so it looks for a difference um, on either edge of your of your edge, but then it averages with decreasing weight uh, as you move away for, from the edge. So it's looking for an edge um, that is consistent over a certain range. Um, and then finally, we say smooth diff uh, np dot. Let's go with NDI. Uh, noisy signal and cost diff mode equals reflect lt dot plot smooth diff. Okay, um, and so you can see it's a little bit smoother than that original version. It's actually quite similar. Um, so you can see the the Highest peak is where your edge was in the middle. Let's just add a plt dot plot of noisy signal. All right. So hopefully that was clear enough. That's one D filtering, um, and now you can see what two D filtering is all about. It's basically the same thing except over two axes. Um, so let's move into that. Unless anyone has any questions about what just happened. Okay, so let's look at the simplest uh, image, which is a little square with just bright pixels in the middle and dark pixels around. Um, so that's what Matplotlib shows it as. Um, and now we're going to do a mean filter, which, is, which uses a kernel. Um, just like before, we had a um, size 3 kernel with a third along the way. Now we have a 3 by 3 kernel with um, one that has nine elements, and so it's one ninth uh, everywhere. So that's our mean kernel. So now, if you think about every pixel in the image, um, you're going to stamp that kernel on it, and then you're going to multiply the um, surrounding values by one ninth each, and then you're going to add, add all that together. And that's going to give you the average of that neighborhood at that pixel, and then you slide it along, and you do it on the next one. So let's have a look at um, what that looks like. So here's our um, input array. And now you can see at this position here, um, if you put your average filter around it, you catch a single one. And so you get one ninth of that position, and that's this value here. If you put your... Um, kernel in the next spot along, then you catch two, and so you get two nines in that position, and so on. And if you place it like smack in the middle, then the average of all ones is one. Fair enough. Um, so this is a little animation just like the other one, except um, it's for two-dimensional convolution. Um, so on the left, you have your input image with um, just bright and dark. And then we're going to slide this convolution kernel around. And uh, whenever we hit that pixel that's um, surrounded by yellow, um, we're going to replace it with, in the output on the right side with the average of the pixels in the covered area. So on the projector, you probably can't see, but that turned a little bit higher gray. And you can see it now if you move it along. So now we're taking the average of um, two-thirds black and 
uh, one third white, and that gives us um, 0.33 value in that position. So you can see the kernel going all along the image and um, producing that output. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, cool. Okay, well you know all about convolution now. It's really variations on this theme. Um, one of the things that I just want to point out, it's sometimes important, is that the values of your kernel um, sum to one, um, and that will keep the intensity of your image uh, constant overall, um, which might be important to you. OK, so let's look at it on a real image. Um, because when you look at real images, you can see the advantages and disadvantages of different kernels, with meaning different values in those, in, in those boxes. Um, so it's a little hard to see without zooming in. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a pixelated version of the image, where we downsample it by tenfold. Um, and then this is just a helper function to sh show images side by side. So you can ignore that bit. OK. So now if we run this on an image, you can see that you get the smoothing the same way that we had smoothing for our 1D signal. And now we're going to see different filters. Um, and so we're sort of almost done with hand making the values in those filters. And we're going to see the ones that are predefined for you in scikit image. Um, so the one we already had a clue, we hand built a, a one dimensional Gaussian kernel before. Um, with um, scikit image, um, you can just <coughs> import filters and use filters.gaussian, and that will create that kernel for you and convolve it with the image. Um, so that's the result. Um, so you can see that the Gaussian image retains a bit more of its square shape than the uh, mean filter. So in general, in signal processing, you want to use Gaussian over a uh, square mean filter um, to preserve your signal better. Um, let's see if this shows it better. Yeah, so when you look at it on the full image, you can see that if you do a mean kernel, you get these banding artifacts as the kernel is crossing over an edge. Whereas because you get a smooth degradation of the weights uh, over the kernel with Gaussian, you don't, you don't get that, um, those artifacts. Um, make sense? Cool. Um, in the interest of time, we're going to um, skip the, the next exercise. Um, the, so this is what the two-dimensional Gaussian kernel looks like. Um, it's just a bright spot with smoothly fading away intensity. Um, if you want to look at the plot of that one line, um, there's just a reminder of chapter zero that we're dealing with NumPy arrays, and so you can do everything that you're comfortable with doing with NumPy arrays. In this case, we can say profile is kernel yeah, uh, of um, every row, and we only want one column, which is the middle one. So it's kernel dot shape of one integer divided by two, plt dot plot of profile. OK, so that's you can see that you get a nice smooth bell curve if you take a cross section of that, of that blob. OK, so edge filtering in 2D gets a little more complicated than in 1D. Um, so um, the very basic kernels, um, you, you have orientations of your edges now, um, which correspond to the axes of your data. Um, so just like we had a difference filter, now we're doing a vertical kernel, which is a two-dimensional array uh, with three rows and one column. And the values are minus 1, 0, and 1. And as you might expect, if you, um, let me actually do plt.subplots 1, 2. So x of 0 is that. And we're going to say x of 1 is the original. Pixelated. OK. 
Um, so now what you're seeing is um, when the image goes from <coughs> bright to dark, you get a low value here um, because you're subtracting from zero, you're subtracting a high value. And then when it goes over here, it goes from dark to bright, and so you get a high value in the, in the output. So again, this is the exact same principle as the 1D filtering, uh, except we're doing it on every column of, of the array. Um, again, I think I want to get to a bit further along, so I'm just going to do this exercise for you. Um, always feel free to revisit um, and ping us on all of the channels that we mentioned in the index if you want extra help after this workshop. Um, so to do the horizontal gradient, so I had a vertical kernel, which is that. Um, if you've done a little bit of NumPy, you might know that dot .t transposes your kernel. Um, so um, it takes rows to columns and columns to rows. Um, sorry, and by kernel I mean array, any array. This works with any array. So I can say horizontal kernel is that. And then the magnitude is the gradient. Um, the square root, it's kind of like Pythagoras' theorem. You take the square root of the square of their horizontal gradient and your vertical gradient. Um, so we say horizontal, uh, gradient horizontal. is uh, NDI, do I use NDI? Yeah. Horizontal kernel, no, image. Is it, no, it's pixelated. <coughs> mode equals reflect. I don't actually use the mode because that's the default. Oh, and we need to convert this to float. or we're going to get um, overflow. Okay, and now I can say gradient magnitude is equal to np dot square root of gradient vertical squared plus gradient horizontal squared. So this is one of the nice things about working in, in Python and NumPy is that these kind of mathematical operations become very natural, right? So we're just saying square root of two things squared, and you can just do it, and it does it on the whole image for you. Um, so that's pretty nice. And I can do show gradient mag. And the reason you do square is that typically when you're doing image processing, you don't care that this is a negative edge and a positive edge. In some situations you might, but we just care that there's an edge there. Um, so that's what you get here. So you get a, a dark image wherever there's no edge and a bright image uh, where there's an edge. So this is a kind of nice way to find the edges in, in images. It's very fundamental to um, image processing. OK, so one of the really common edge filters is this um, Sobel filter. Um, so, um, this is the kernel um, that Sobo uses. Um, so instead of being a single uh, pixel wide with minus one, zero, one, um, the same way that we did averaging uh, in a 1D situation, here we're doing averaging, but we're doing averaging along this axis. So you're looking for edges that are consistent a little, you know, over a span of three pixels. And that gives you a, bit, a little bit of um, more resistance to noise than, than the one that we used. Um, and if you use filter Sobel without the vertical and the horizontal um, in it, then it's doing the gradient magnitude for you with these two things combined. Um, so you can have a look at the Sobel edge filter on the bright square and the Sobel edge filter on the pixelated image. Um, so if you go back, you can compare that it's a little bit smoother than our single pixel gradient magnitude. OK. Does anyone have a question about edge filtering in images? Did that make sense? I see some nods. I'll take that as good enough. Um, so for the next five minutes, <laughs> uh, this is not a five-minute exercise, 
Um, <laughs> you guys don't mind a shorter break, right? All right, well, I'll give you the choice of whether you want to push through with this or um, take a slightly longer break. Um, so have any of you heard of saying that logistic regression is the very simplest neural network that you can do? It's like a one neural neural network. How many people here have worked with neural networks at all in images? Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to find like a very sing simple neuron. Um, and this neuron is looking at the horizontal. So we're going to assume that our ground truth is this horizontal um, subill filter. Um, so, but we don't, we're going to ignore the filter now. And so we have our source data and we have our target data. And we want to use scikit-learn to learn um, the filter that will recover this. Um, so there are the steps. Um, and I'll just give you guys um, yeah, however much you want. So the next, the next thing on the schedule is a break until 3.30. Um, and then we'll start up the segmentation. Um, so do as much as you can in the next three minutes. And then I'll, I'll quickly go over it before handing off to Josh after the break. All right. All right, um, so I'm going to quickly go over this exercise. Um, so yeah, there's, there's kind of a lot to unpack here. Um, so I, I think I didn't leave you enough time to do it, but I'll still do it as a demo. So if I do from SK image import util, and I do windows equals, what's the file? It's image, okay. So windows is equal to util.view as windows. Oh, because it's not imported yet. Uh, image, and I want a three by three window. Um, then I can say print windows.shape. Um, so my original image for reference is print image dot shape is 512 by 512. <clears throat> view as windows doesn't actually do any padding on your image. We, we could have done padding and then done view as windows, but we'll skip that. So you end up with, um, for every position in the original, so if you're looking at 0, 0 in the view as windows, you're at the 1, 1 position, so you're 1 away from the edge because you don't have any padding. Um, and then you're looking at a three by three window around that position. Um, so just to clarify that a bit more, I can do windows of zero, zero, and I can do image of zero to three, zero to three, and I can print those two things. Okay, so it's just a convenient way to look at uh, a kind of image of windows, of overlapping windows. Um, so it's a cute little function um, to do this sort of stuff. Um, so now we want to, because um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn a mapping between uh, each little window and the position in the, in the new uh, target image, um, and scikit-learn uh, actually wants a uh, number of samples by number of features array. Um, how many people have used scikit-learn in this room? Okay, great, awesome. So then that would not be too surprising. So now we're going to say the, uh, x to use scikit-learn per lens is windows dot reshape. And we want 510 by 510 in the front, the number of samples. So each, each window is a sample. And 9, because every element in that window becomes a feature. Um, that should work. Yes. Um, OK, so now we have this feature matrix x. Um, 
Now to get the target values y, remember that we don't have any patches from the very border, so we're actually going to say y, what's, what did we call our thing? Target, okay? So y is target of 1 to minus 1, so we're going to trim away the first row and the last row, and 1 to minus 1, same for the columns, and then dot ravel, which is the same as dot reshape, 510 by 510. Okay, and now we do from sklearn.linear model import logistic regression. And now we can say rank equals actually CLF, I think. <coughs> so logistic regression and then CLF.fit xy. Oh, what happened? Okay, that's not a big deal. Specify a solver, so I'm going to say solver equals LBFGS. That'll make it cleaner. Very good. Now what? Oh. All right, I'm not going to do that solver because it doesn't like it. Great. So now I can look at... Um, the coefficients of my classifier, so CLF dot coef, um, and that looks a bit wonky. Uh, but remember that our nine features are actually a three by three patch, so we can say CLF dot coef dot reshape three three, um, and hopefully you can see that this looks very much like the Sobel multiplied by a constant. Um, so this is one, two, one, zero, zero, zero. Sorry, minus one, minus two, minus one, zero, 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 one, two, one. Okay, so this is the basis of, of neural networks is taking these patches um, and learning a mapping between the patch and a target. Um, and then um, neural networks just stack this process over several layers deep to be able to learn increasingly complex functions uh, between your patches and your targets. Um, but this is a nice little basic demonstration of it um, and um, the relationship between um, filters and convolutional neural networks. Okay, so with that, we're going to switch to segmentation. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Any questions? Um, it, it would be the same thing. So this would be, so I just happen to know that the target is the right shape at this point, um, but I, I would normally, this works equally well, which would be 510 by 510. Does that make sense? The second one? So uh, Ravel, do you know what Ravel does? It just, yeah, it reshapes into a single line. Um, here I'm reshaping into a single line, just being explicit with the size. Does that make sense? Or can you? S I mean, just because Ravel is quicker to type, that's really the only reason. Um, the only re and the reason I didn't use it here is that I don't actually want Ravel. I want a 2D array in the original. But for the for the target, I want a 1D array, so I could I could use Ravel. Um, yeah. Any other questions about that? Yeah, so TensorFlow Keras would, so logistic regression is kind of like a very specific uh, neuron. Um, so they do a lot fancier things because they want to do this on the GPU and so on. Um, but it's, it's the very same principle. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a factor uh, difference. Um, I think the reason why you get uh, a factor difference is that um, our original, uh, the way we created the target um, is by thresholding, um, whereas the Sobel fi filter is actually doing a, a smooth, um, what's the word, um, sigmoid um, in the target. And so you, you're not going to get the exact same mapping from one to the other. 
Okay, uh, so let me get out of full screen. Set X KB. Yes. Yeah. So there is um, more dimensional. Yes. Yes. So it takes, it takes, uh, and this is something that's very useful to keep in mind with images and being NumPy arrays is that you've got your whole 2D array image, um, or it can be 3D, um, but in memory, in, in your RAM, that's just a big line of values with some metadata about the shape of, of the thing. And so when you're looking at the target, as long as you make sure that your reshaping corresponds between the X and the Y, then the only thing you really care about is the fact that this pixel is mapped to this pixel in the Ravel, and then when you reach the end of the row, you get to the next one, and you do the same thing in the Ravel. And so they're always, that correspondence is maintained throughout the whole uh, procedure, yeah. So when we go back to render the image again, we have to reshape again. Exactly, yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, command. Good. And now we're going to go here. All right, good afternoon. My name is uh, Josh Warner. I'm from the University of Arizona, and I primarily work with medical images. Um, before we get started on this uh, topic, which is segmentation, um, by a show of hands, how many of you, I'm assuming everyone either has, is, or plans to work with images at some point in the future that's in this room, uh, hoping you found the right place. Um, and assuming that's true, how many of your images come by default with full annotations and objects are already, you know, identified and oriented and, and they're, it's just ready to go. Anyone? Because I, if I ever get a yes to that, I, I want to know what, I, I'll talk to you later. I'm curious what, uh, what you're doing right. Um, but for the majority of the rest of the world, we are handed these images and expected to make um, sense of them. And one of the core things that we're going to be trying to do is identifying the objects or regions of interest that we would like to then f get further information out of. So that task in and of itself is the subdomain of image processing known as segmentation. And uh, this has also been seen in uh, popular press, um, or rather the popular uh, consciousness uh, going back as far as the movie Terminator. So this is a screenshot from the movie Ter Terminator uh, from behind Arnold's eyes view. And uh, in this instance, the segmentation is identifying a human from background. So this, uh, this white line around the, uh, the individual here in the bar um, is identifying the person of interest. Uh, I guess uh, this person was more interesting than the bartender behind them who is not identified here. Um, so segmentation um, has two major subfields. Uh, at least that's the way I usually like to think about it. There are segmentation algorithms, routines, and approaches which need some form of human input. And those are considered to be supervised. So we have given the algorithm some sort of a priori knowledge, if you want to think about it in a bit of a Bayesian way, about the, uh, about the problem. And then the algorithm then takes that and tries to uh, extrapolate it um, so that we can, we can give it a fairly sparse input, um, maybe just a, a dot here and a, um, a line over there that we, to represent the area we do and do not want, and then uh, it can go and then basically take it from there. Um, but we have to give it something if it's supervised. On the other hand, we have unsupervised algorithms. Those are algorithms that are going to try and act entirely on their own. We may set parameters beforehand to define how that they work um, and tune them for our particular problem, but they do not actually involve, for every um, image or question that you're asking, require you to do some sort of identifying a seed point, providing some sort of a priori input. This is a key point that I wanted to 
bring to you up front because you should basically beginning your segmentation workflow um, analysis, how you're going to approach the problem. Um, it, it, can I have, you know, is it a tractable thing to consider having some level of human input or not? Because if it is, then supervised algorithms will often give you a better result. Just you have to plan for that when you're designing your approach. Um, so I won't go through all these now because we're basically going to touch on all of them throughout the, the course of the tutorial. So as we're getting started here, oh good, one, uh, one was truthful with me, it's now normal keyboard layout, he's a Dvorak guy. Um, this, uh, this cell here, uh, all we're going to do is just import NumPy, um, set things up with matplotlib. Actually, let me, uh, let me scroll back just a little bit and get the matplotlib back and working so that we're able to actually see the results later. And uh, then uh, several areas of scikit image we're just bringing on board. Um, this particular helper function is just handy because we're going to show quite a few images um, in this tutorial in various ways, uh, and it's just a convenience to, to make it a little prettier. Uh, so we get a subplot. Uh, we could have more than one subplot if we like. That's just passed straight through. Figure side is pretty big, um, and uh, we just show the image and then turn off the axis. That's all that does for us. Okay, so one of the most Basic and easiest to, to grasp thresholding tasks is, uh, sorry, segmentation tasks is just threshold. <coughs> so you're going to take an image, um, is it mostly a black and white image, and then based on some value, uh, you're going to say, I would like all of the results that are less than or greater than a particular uh, piece of it. So we've got some test images in the package, and one of them is this one, which has, uh, which is a screenshot of a segmentation textbook, actually. Um, but not a screenshot, it's a it's actual photo of the textbook and as a result, and it wasn't necessarily done ideally because it, the, uh, the exposure is not quite right. And that's something that happens in the real world when we're acquiring data. So um, as an initial, one of the ways we think about um, the image, we can look at this, but if we want to actually um, consider the individual um, values that are behind each one of these pixels. Um, this one is, as Stefan was mentioning earlier, it's a um, uint8 image, so it's ranged from 0 to 255. Uh, it, each pixel could have any value between there and its grayscale. So a simple histogram is a way for us to look at the pixel value, sorry, yeah, the pixel value that each pixel has versus the frequency that that occurs in the image. This can help you if it's a, um, it's a if it's a well exposed image. You might have a bimodal distribution where it would have um, a darker region if it's text um, that's down here, and that's probably what you want, and then a lighter region up here, and that's probably the background of the page. But that would be too easy for us, so uh, we're going to live in the real world with images that aren't necessarily exposed perfectly. Um, so it's not immediately obvious from this histogram where we would choose to uh, place our line and say everything above that's what we want, everything below that's what we don't want. Um, so as our first just uh, experimentation, let's just try a couple of very simple thresholds. You don't need anything from scikit-image to actually do a threshold on an image, it's an array. Um, so based on what we're seeing in this histogram, um, we'll do this uh, just with, uh, with everybody at the same time. Does anyone have a value that they would like to pick out of here uh, to try and threshold our text image f with. 225? All right, so, and we want more than or less than 225? Less. Got to choose. All right, so text, uh, image less than 250, 225. And, uh, and then what do we get? All right, so that's done reasonably well over here where it was lightest. Um, and, uh, and he's picked that by choosing something that's kind of right in here. So he's picked the, the, um, the obvious largest peak of the whites and excluded that. But then now uh, the rest of this is, is just kind of blown out. So anybody else have an idea? 60. 60, great. Fantastic. So now, honestly, that worked pretty well for like the left half of the image. And then we start <coughs> losing things uh, in kind of the right mid to to two-thirds across, and, and uh, it's not really legible on the far right. Uh, anyone else want to try again? 100. 100, all right. Okay, so that's probably readable throughout the majority of it. We lose a little bit of this text. Um, where I'm going with this is that there actually isn't an ideal value. There's no perfect value for this, um, 
particular example uh, because it's hard and it's a little more like how the real world really works. Um, so if you don't want to set a threshold every time, maybe you want to ask uh, one of the algorithms that we have available. So uh, this one I'll give you some time to experiment with yourself. Um, so what we have in our filter submodule is a number of threshold algorithms, which if you just put your cursor right where I have and hit tab, it'll autocomplete and show you the various ones that are available there. Um, and basically just choose a couple of these. Um, I've recommended Atsu and Lee, and then you could also take a look at uh, Savola. I may, have, I may have butchered that. I haven't met the guy. Um, or, uh, or the local uh, thresholding methods, and just see what, see what works for you. Um, what this gives you back, though, all of these threshold methods actually give you back the threshold itself. And so it's not actually the thresholded image like what we were doing. So we still have to actually um, put that in, and that's what this will do for you. So I'll give you a, a couple minutes uh, to just sort of experiment with how this works and uh, see if you find anything that worked pretty well. And then we'll reconvert in uh, about two minutes. I heard, just heard an ooh over in this corner. Uh, did anyone have some uh, good results? All right, what, how did, what did you try? Huh? All right. If I can only spell it. Um, and, uh, and what did you uh, use for the parameters of it? Great. All right. Pretty darn good. So what exactly is that doing? Savola so is a um, one of our more more advanced uh, models. So it it is like local. It's a different way to do a local threshold. So instead of giving you a global best value for the whole image, which is how some of these other ones work, Atsu and Lee are both like that. Um, Savola tries to give you an ideal threshold for every pixel. Um, and uh, you can look through this formula and figure out how it actually works. There are some other parameters you can tweak, um, which you can read about if you would like, but uh, sometimes you just kind of hit that one out of the park. Local also works quite well. Um, when I did that one, though, I think I had to uh, change the offset on local. Um, in the interest of time, we, we can move on from this uh, to something a little bit uh, more interesting and difficult to think about. So supervised segmentation. Um, is in general um, a little bit more of a user-friendly technique than trying to place a single threshold and have that do all of your work across the entire image. Because most of the results that are interesting that we would like to look at today um, are sub-regions of an image. Um, of course, there's the photoshopping someone in an image, which is practically a verb now uh, in the English lexicon. Um, but to do that, you have to use the program in order to identify the person. So let's try that. Um, we'll use a different image, a real image. This one is of the astronaut Eileen Collins. It's shipped with a package. Um, and this is a, a public domain image uh, that was taken by NASA before she went on uh, a space shuttle mission. And uh, one of the things that uh, we can try and do with this is to try and segment out um, the head from the background, which is sort of your standard Photoshop technique. Uh, so the contrast is pretty decent for the head against the background, so uh, some of our algorithms may use color, but in most cases it's easier to think about things, especially from a tutorial perspective in grayscale. So we'll just go ahead and convert that to, uh, to grayscale, and uh, then we have this is the result. And RGB2 gray um, is doing what Stefan showed us earlier with the perceptually accurate uh, proportionality between red, green, and blue fairly heavily weighted toward green. So uh, we're going to actually use three methods, not two, but we'll start with these two. Um, and both of these techniques can be seen in, uh, are, are available through scikit-image.segmentation. So the first one, um, I'll just go over them uh, as we get to them. The first one is called active contours. So in this case, what we do is you as the user have to tell the algorithm what the initial contour is. So you can't just give it um, a random um, point somewhere. It actually has to be some level of a contour. It can be, a, it doesn't have to be a closed contour, although in this case we will use a closed contour. We have to actually give it some contour. And then it iteratively moves that and tries to see if it can better approach 
edges or better um, approximate uh, the segmentation that you're trying to do with a little bit of force on it to try and contract if you're using it in the mode that we are, which is as a, um, as a closed contour. Um, so when the contraction force is balanced by the, uh, the resistance that it feels in trying to go over little ridges in the image, if you will, areas of higher contrast, um, then it converges and it says I'm done and gives you um, a result back. So to do this, uh, we have to actually give it that, uh, that path. So all this helper function does is give you a circle of points um, based on what we ask for. So in this case, um, instead of having you all try and figure out what a good circle and, and uh, center would be, um, we'll just use the point 100, 220 as the center point and a radius of 100, um, which is large enough so that the whole head is within. Um, you could easily find this just iteratively by yourselves, but for the purposes of time, we'll just go there. Um, and then for, because it's going to be a closed path in this case, we're not gonna duplicate it. We used lens space here instead of um, range or a range. And so we actually have a point at zero and a point at two pi, which for those uh, that remember from trigonometry are the exact same. So we're gonna remove one of those and that's why uh, this is in here. So that's pretty simple. Um, and then if you actually want to see that on the astronaut, um, we can run this and it'll give us an error, but uh, this is our initial result. We just don't have a final result yet. That's why it threw that error. So this is the initial contour. We're just making a circle that includes the entire astronaut's head as our initialization. Um, and uh, what we're actually computing it on is the grayscale. I'm showing it to you in color though. Um, and so if we just do this, we'll uh, run the active contour with our points and then we'll see how it works. Hmm. Not exactly what we were hoping for, as far as, you know, to, to kind of get down to the, uh, the actual astronaut's head there. Um, and that's a little bit of a theme with this particular tutorial is that uh, we aren't necessarily going to immediately come to the perfect result. Uh, because you won't in real life either. And so in, when we run into something that isn't perfect, what are we going to do? We're going to go back into the actual uh, routine that we're using. And we're going to start looking at the, uh, the knobs that we can twist and turn on there uh, to, to uh, make things work better. So what did it seem like this did not do? It seems like it didn't contract enough, right? It just didn't quite get there. It didn't move much at all. Um, so let's see if there's anything um, like potentially a parameter that can help us with that. So, all right, so the alpha parameter, um, moving that up makes it contract faster. That sounds like something we would be interested in. So uh, what's the alpha? The default for alpha is 0 0.01. And uh, so let's be bold and change it, uh, not to just a tiny little bit, but let's change it by an order of magnitude and see what that actually will do for us. Some of you may notice that it actually ran faster. And that's because now it, uh, it didn't need as many iterations to get to the point where it said that it was done. Before, it didn't actually ever get to the point that it said it was done. It kept moving tiny little bits and it never got there. So now uh, it actually has reached what it's considering to be a final condition and uh, come back to us and says, yep, I'm finished. Um, <coughs> this is a much better result. I think most of us would agree. Uh, but it's not necessarily perfect. There's some uh, areas of, you know, that aren't uh, the astronaut that are included. It's probably usable. Um, in the interest of time, I think we'll move on, but there, uh, there is one other thing that you could, uh, I think it was edge. If I remember right when I was making this, if I tweak the edge parameter just slightly, no, nope, must have been the other way. The changes now are subtle because we're actually fairly close to um, an ideal segmentation. That did not help. So I think, I think my recommended solution uh, in the solutions notebook is 1.3, if I remember right. Um, and, uh, and it's not entirely perfect, but it's more than usable. Um, so this is one approach that may be useful for you depending on how your imager uh, problem is, uh, is actually defined. Another approach, which is an entirely different algorithm, but is also supervised segmentation, um, 
is, uh, is called Random Walker. So this one is conceptually entirely different from the last one. So the last one we had this snake or path that we were iteratively moving to try and get it to an ideal place. Uh, random Walker basically says that you can give it any input you like. So you can say um, a dot here, a line over there is perfectly fine. And what it's going to do is it's going to use the actual image itself um, as a cost array. So a cost array means that the cost is higher if you're moving between a point and an adjacent point that is different. So then the more different they are, the more costly it is to actually make that change. So the goal here is to find the shortest and cheapest path to move uh, from uh, on the image itself to actually get back to both of, or however many of the um, labels that you've provided to the image from every point. Then, um, whichever one is closer in the overall cost ends up being the winner, and that's what that point ends up being labeled. Does that make sense? Anyone have a question about that? Yes? So in this case, we're going to provide them. Uh, you mean in the last example or, or for random walker? So uh, that was just uh, basically when I started this, I wanted a circle that was larger than the astronaut's head that was loosely that included it. It didn't have to be perfect. Um, and so I came up with those to make this a little bit um, more efficient in the tutorial uh, time frame. But it's just a little bit of an um, iterative, like a, a small point picker or just a little bit of an iterative plotting could get you to a point kind of near the uh, center of the, the face and hair of the astronaut. Yeah, you're welcome. Anything else? Okay. So we're going to use that same point as, uh, or actually we're going to use our same points, both of them, uh, from before as our seed values here. Um, and the labels, in this case, um, I, we don't give a set of points to random walker. We give a label image. So the image itself, zero, um, is considered unlabeled. And then um, we want to tell, actually, is it negative one? I don't want to lead you wrong. Yes, zero labeled pixels or unlabeled pixels. Okay. Um, so zero is considered, considered unlabeled and fair game. So all the points which were zero are going to be filled in at the end of the algorithm. Everything else in the label image that you tell it is going to be the truth that you're giving it. So this is the a priori information. You, maybe someone you employ, um, put a dot or a line or a scribble on the area that you were interested in and then selected a different tool and put a different um, value around it in the area you're not interested in, and Random Walker is going to attempt to find the ideal separation between the two. That is the general approach. Um, so we're going to use the same, uh, same points that we did before, uh, but in this case we're going to just go ahead and put a, uh, uh, we're going to give the, the outside a 1 and the inside um, a 2. And this is what it looks like. So uh, the outside is I uh, the outside. Sorry, I, re I reversed them. So the indices that in the middle here are the center. They're slightly less intense, and uh, they have a radius of twenty-five. And then the outside are the ones we had before. So and those are two. So it's labeled one inside. That's what we want. And labeled two on the outside, what we don't want. Um, and I didn't bother plotting the astronaut back here, but this, that's what we're going to give the algorithm. So then we're going to run random walker. We we'll wait a couple of seconds, and uh, we see how it worked. Hmm. Okay, so uh, that's not ideal. Um, what does it kind of look like it did? It kind of looks like it drew more or less a circle almost directly in between where these would have been. So that means that uh, the cost penalty for going over all the ridges in the image probably wasn't high enough. 
So we want to kind of increase the topography of the image, if you will. So if you, if you took this image and, and we're looking at it straight on, but if you took and looked at it uh, from an angle and then you modified the, the height and topography of it by how, um, what the, uh, how light or dark the images are, um, what you would get is you know, a series of ridges and, and that that you would have to go over. So we have a parameter that is in the random walker that lets us sort of determine or control how um, penalized it is to go over those. And it is, it is the beta parameter. So beta penalization. So if it's higher, the more difficult it is to go over things. So in this case, basically because it wasn't very hard for the algorithm to go over these little ridges, it more or less just um, <coughs> drew a, a circle that was right in between what we had before. So let's make it a little more difficult. All right, anyone have any suggestions? 9,000. 9, 9, well, we're going to go over 9,000, if that's OK, yeah. actually. Um, <laughs> All right, not bad. So now we've made it harder for those things to diffuse, which means that these actual topographical, topographical features, um, otherwise known as these contrasty areas of the image, are more difficult for things to get on one side or the other of. And so now it's going to tend to hold itself inside there. Now, um, I cheated slightly on this one. I didn't cheat. But the, one of the reasons that I didn't give a single pixel, I actually gave a circle as the input here, is so that some of my pixels were already in the darker hair. So if I didn't do that, it's actually much more difficult to get the hair included in the, uh, in the face, uh, in with the face, if you just have one or the other in your initial values for this. Um, because it just, it's kind of equally difficult for things to get into that region. Um, so, uh, and in all of these, you'll note that this earlobe is, has a little bit of a difficulty because it's fairly light relative to the rest of the face and does not have a good contrasty boundary like the, um, like the jawline does throughout the rest of the image. Um, and so it's, it's a challenge to get that earlobe correct. So it turns out over 9,000 is pretty good. Um, our initial recommendation, uh, just the default in the package, is 130. And uh, well, different Im look, different images, right? This is a fairly contrasty image, uh, but different images. You know, 130 actually works quite well um, in some other uh, contexts. So there is no one size fits all when it comes to segmentation parameters. You got to actually test things on your own images and your own data. Um, so. I think the recommended uh, one in the solution worksheet is 2,500. And it's most likely going to look quite similar to the over 9,000. Just a slight difference right at the edge. And uh, it might include slightly more of the earlobe. But they're both very usable. OK. Now, the third supervised technique is fairly new to scikit image, um, relatively speaking. It got added uh, since last year's uh, tutorial, um, one of my personal interests uh, was getting this one through. Um, and flood fill is basically the paint bucket tool in your favorite um, simple image editor. So you pick a point, you'll pick just one point, and from there it's going to iteratively check and see if all the points around it are equal to that or within a tolerance. And if they are, it's going to say you're part of the flood and uh, include those in the segmentation. Um, so it's a simpler technique. But um, it, it can be effective if you have a relatively homogeneous region of the image. In this case, it turns out it's not quite as effective as the other ones were because we're starting as it happens. Uh, if you actually plotted that one, our seed point in here, um, which we can do. Actually, we'll just say. And Matplotlib transposes these. So our initial point here is in a fairly light area. And then um, what we've done is we've given it the seed point, but because uh, the 
It turns out that we also have a tolerance that we can use with this. Um, so in this case, we've converted the image as it happens through the grayscale. It started out as a 0 to 255, but after it went through grayscale, it's now a float image. And so now it's on the range of 0 to 1. So our tolerance is, is fairly low in this case. Um, you can go ahead and experiment with this. Uh, it's a very quick one, so if you just make that tolerance lower, um, it won't go as far from its actual from the seed point. Um, but it's difficult to find one that's going to include both these lighter areas of the face and the slightly darker area of the hair. Um, I had an example planned, which I don't think I'm going to get into uh, for time perspective, that uh, basically you would experiment here and could do this on your free time. Um, where instead of trying to get all of that at once, um, we would actually set a point in the background and try and segment out the background and then the astronaut's collar. And you can actually do both of those individually pretty well with flood fill and then combine them into a segmentation where you kind of have the not face, which is just as useful as having the face um, because it's simple and simply just inverting it. Um, so you could try that uh, on your own time, but I think I'll skip forward in the interest of time. Does anyone have questions about any of those or supervised segmentation at large? <coughs> All right. So unsupervised segmentation is when you have too many images or it's not feasible or tractable to have some sort of input that has a priori information about what you're interested in in those images. Um, and uh, the, we also have algorithms that are useful for this. One of them. Um, it uses a common machine learning algorithm under the hood, which is uh, k-means, actually. Um, and what this is going to do, uh, this algorithm actually works in colors, so we'll give it color, is that it actually gives us back um, a number of discrete regions, um, which here we've labeled with the, or the average of all of their regions. So this is kind of... No, I gave it no input. I just handed it the image and I said, I want about um, whatever the default is, which I think is about 100. Yep, the, the average number of segments you're going to get out of it to begin with is 100. Um, and that's what I would like out of it. And that's just all I asked. It's done pretty quick. And uh, it gives you fairly meaningful subregions of an image. Now, this wouldn't ideally segment the astronaut's head if you combine several of them because it's overflowed. And that has to do with how Slick tries to generally um, hold itself into a grid if you set the compactness high enough. But if I actually increased the number of segments a bit, let's double it, there's a good chance that most of those boundaries, not quite all, but most of those boundaries have now been, um, have now been broken. And if we increase it further, Juan made this algorithm, so he's just laughing in the corner. <laughs> All right, so it really doesn't want to break that particular boundary. But you can see where, um, see, see where I'm going with this, is that you get to the point where a limited subset of these could be picked rather quickly, um, and then they individually have some meaning. If we really go crazy with this, um, and start increasing by orders of magnitude, then you'll start th seeing things pop out, and it'll look almost just like um, a posterized image, if you will, sort of like uh, a f maybe an Instagram filter or something else from that um, uh, type of deal. And see, uh, Slick tries to have things be in a grid, and then it modifies based on that. So in these flat background areas, it's mostly still a grid. Um, and then areas of more interesting things, um, it, it has modified those boundaries, and that's kind of why Sometimes it wants to it wants to break through um, your interesting boundaries, but um, well, one of the things we've really done is we've taken what was initially over two hundred and fifty thousand individual points of data, and compressed those down into meaningful subregions that were in the hundreds, and that's a meaningful uh, change in the uh, in the amount of data that you have to work through and have to deal with. And so this is useful um, as a data reduction step as well. Um, another unsupervised, uh, does anyone have questions about SLIC? All right. Is that an acronym for something? It is. I'm glad you asked so I can look it up. 
Also, there's a compactness parameter that might have been used. Yeah. Uh, so, Juan, do you know the uh, acronym for this off the top of your head? There you go. Simple linear iterative clustering. The question was, what does it stand for something? 150, I should see where I sit here. 150? I didn't think I had to go that high. Thank you. What's that? So does 20. 20? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's based on a k-means. So you're going to have, uh, just depending on however many uh, blocks you end up giving it and it ends up assigning, it may well do things differently uh, if you change stuff as much as just one. Um, yes? So I think the question was pertaining to like, is this possible? Is this usable for any image that has a face in it? Is it pertaining to face detection? This is not in and of itself a face detection algorithm. It may be useful as part of a workflow, um, but the goal with this is really to go from a very large number of pixels to a smaller number of super pixels is what the algorithm's uh, paper is representing um, or suggesting that we use as, as the uh, the name of it. And those smaller number of super pixels have some similar um, meaning within the group that then you can consider within that group instead of needing to consider every piece of the image individually. Uh, another one that we're going to get to in, in a minute is uh, Felschenschwalb, and that one is, is similar to Slick. Um, Sean Wies is a different uh, linear, sorry, a different um, unsupervised segmentation algorithm. This one uses a level set. Now a level set behind the scene is simply a separate array that has values that are on, uh, that it's either positive or negative on either side of zero. And then the resulting segmentation contour is simply where you would draw the line as they would transit between positive to negative or negative to positive. So it is the level set if you think about it like a, top, like a topographical example, it's where you would pass sea level, where exactly sea level is on this um, topographical image that's underlying this. Um, I'm not going to go in great detail beyond that. This is actually a, a decent uh, algorithm for binarization tasks because it's going to just give you back um, ones and zeros. It, it doesn't give you more than that. It'll only ever give you just ones and zeros. Um, so for example, uh, if you use this on that text that we had earlier, the result's actually pretty good. Um, in this case, it's, it's basically going to try and define light from dark, and it's done a reasonable job of it. Um, it tends to have these more lobulated continuous borders, and that's an artifact of the underlying level set, because you can think of this almost like a attempting to uh, approximate the topography of the image. Um, so I mainly just wanted to expose you all to this algorithm. Um, it has a number of parameters that you can experiment on, with on your own time, similar to most of the others, uh, but it's useful for binarization. So if you basically want to do a fancy threshold on an image, this is a good one to consider. Um, okay. Are we, uh, are we together? Anyone have questions about Sean Wies? The world at large? No. Um, OK, so the last unsupervised method that we're going to take a look at quick here is Felschenschwalb. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Not sure, though. Um, this one actually requires color. Um, and uh, similar to Slick, but um, unlike Slick, this one gives you quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of regions to begin with. Um, so how many, how many do you think it gave us? Anyone, anyone have a guess? I've got an example here, um, or a potential example that we could have run, but in terms of, but in the interest of time, um, I think I'll just introduce you to, does anyone have an idea about how you would get the number of unique labels using a NumPy function? Unique, unique yes. <laughs> I kind of I tipped it a little bit. Um, 
So if we just go ahead and put in All right, so uh, we start at zero and we end at 3294, so it's probably 3295, but just in case it screwed up and mislabeled some, um, we can verify that yes, so it's, it's densely labeled, there's no skips in there. So we have over 3000 um, sub pixel regions by default. Um, so if we go ahead and take that and um, <coughs> borrow some code that we used before, um, when I give you this image where uh, we basically took the labels and then turned them into colors. So that's what this is doing, label to RGB color. Um, so it takes the label image um, and then based on the actual underlying image, um, it's giving you back the average of each individual label. So let's go ahead and just borrow that. Uh -oh. Juan's doesn't have a control key in the lower left of his keyboard. Guess we'll do it this way. It, he does, but it's like there's a function key in the far lower left anyway. There we go. And he gave us the exact same result because we haven't actually fed it the right input. And here, so instead of having that grid in the background like Slick did, which has a, it relates to its compactness parameter, in this case, uh, it, it's basically almost as if you just reduce the bit depth of the image down to a tremendous degree, you, you would get something, um, something like this. It's the same resolution as it was, even though it looks mildly pixelated, and that's just because we've kind of reduced it from, again, 262,000 to 3,200 um, super pixel um, areas that we can um, that we can deal with. So this is sometimes called over-segmentation. Uh, this is where you take an image and you generate enough of these that it will most likely, given an input, um, have some combination of them put together will be the object that you want. Um, and now you have to find that in a, a haystack, uh, including multiple elements of 3,000 instead of who knows how many pixels in 262,000. So you've reduced your problem. Um, by reducing it further, you can try, you can take these over-segmented regions um, and then use what's called a region adjacency graph to, um, to see how closely related each individual and adjacent one actually is. So um, we have region adjacency graphs and they are robust, but we might change the way that you interact with them in the future. So that's one of the uh, areas of the package that's called future. So in Python and Python 2, if you, you use that, uh, you could import from the future. Um, we're now doing that in scikit-image. So we're in, from scikit-image future.graph, we're importing um, these, the, the graph submodule there, which has region, region adjacency graphs. In future releases, these will move into the main package in the graph submodule but the way we interact with them might change slightly. So that's why they're still in future. So if we go ahead and make a region adjacency graph based on the original image um, and uh, using these uh, super pixels from Felschenschwalb, but we're gonna add one because it turns out that uh, we want the, uh, our region prop properties that we're gonna use later, um, region properties like random walker, like we were discussing earlier, doesn't include zero. It doesn't look at zero. It assumes zero is the background of the image. In this case, we've densely labeled the entire image, but we included zero in our labels. And so we just add one to all of the labels and send out there from one to uh, 3295, I think was the number instead of 94. And uh, region props will now work on every one of them instead of ignoring whichever poor little Subpixel, a super pixel had zero in it. Um, region props is a very, 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 very useful function in scikit image, which once you define an area of an image, um, you can hand that into region props, and then it will give you quite a lot of different um, quantitative information about that subregion. <coughs> so from size to exactly where the centroid of it is located, so if it looks weird, it'll give you the center, the centroid of it. Um, some of those are also 
being able to calculate it in 3D and we're moving more to be able to be calculated in 3D as we're able. Um, so take a look at region props. It may be very useful for your work along the way. But in this case, what we're going to do is go ahead and um, get the centroids, so where all these regions are located, um, and pass those into our region adjacency graph. Happened pretty quick. This is just a helper function um, that uh, we can essentially just pass over. The, the goal is to actually plot um, the center of these subpixels and then any edges uh, or lines between where they're connected. Uh, and then the result, which takes a second, is here. So we see lots of lots of dense yellow points, and so those are the centroids of each one of these little subregions that we have found and defined with Felsenschwalb. And then the green lines are basically showing us which what what all are they adjacent to. So this is useful because in a standard array, before we did any of this, we knew what all the adjacent pixels were. We just had to look in concordial directions. Uh, but now we don't when we're using super pixels. So we've combined, we've condensed our problem down to a much fewer number of super pixels, but now we have to know what everything's next to. And that's what this does for you. Um, so this is a fully, fully connected one. But now we can threshold it. Um, so does anyone have a number that they would like? It does have to be between 0 and 255, but uh, anyone have a, a number that they would like to experiment with? All right, so let's see how that works. So basically what we're doing is we're removing some edges that are too far apart. So they're still adjacent, but the actual, um, but the actual, but one of them had to go too far to get to the next one. Uh, and uh, as you can see, suddenly some of these more perceptible boundaries between things have started to actually clear up. Um, and as it turns out, the threshold as you lower it uh, it gets more aggressive. So um, it's, it's everything that is below this threshold is, is, is kept, is the way this is uh, considered. So um, in the interest of time. It's fine. OK, sorry. Um, anyone else have a, a number they would like to try? Maybe everyone's already trying all of their, uh, their interesting <laughs> numbers. Uh, I like 20. I also like 42, but let's try 20. Um, and at this point, we're, you can see that we're getting to the point where a lot of uh, these uh, are well separated from the surrounding background and from the surrounding color. Um, and uh, so let's go ahead and just actually cut the graph. Now, how many of you heard of graph cuts? Grab cut, different things like that. You've just been walked through what's going on behind the scenes in those algorithms. Um, so we're going to go ahead and cut the graph at this threshold value, which is it's going to remember from above was 20. And uh, then we are uh, we're going to use that same helper function from color that lets us take the labels that we then found in the cut image. Um, and the cut here, just so that we're all on the same page, is everything that's still connected on this image is going to be considered the same region once we do our cut. So this whole collar region here is going to be its own distinct combined area. Uh, the majority, but not all of the face, is going to be a combined area. Each eye is individual, um, and so on. So we're going to go and cut that graph. And then the result um, is here. So again, there are multiple super pixels in here. This is, actually looks a little more perceptually interesting than uh, than the slick result did, which kind of just blanked the whole face and so on. Uh, but again, you could pretty easily pick out the head of this image um, by selecting a relatively low number of these um, of these super pixels um, that have now they're almost like super super pixels. They started at thirty three thousand, um, and now we have fewer. And how many fewer? So we're down to. Um, under one-fifth as many as we had before. So we continued to decrease. Uh, and if there was then at this level some human input, it would be much simpler to just say, oh yeah, absolutely, I want the, uh, I want the head there. And it would be able to pop out right out of the image. 
Okay, so I think we are now right on time as far as where we were going to take a break. Um, yeah, I'm doing the exercise. Yeah, so uh, during the break or just go ahead and do the exercise? Okay, so we'll give you about 15 minutes to, uh, to play around with the exercise, uh, get some, well actually they may have taken the food, um, but you get some water out there. And uh, essentially, so what we have here is Stefan's, um, Stefan's cat, Chelsea. And can you, uh, with what you've learned, use some of these algorithms to try and segment maybe the cat's nose or maybe one of the cat's eyes? And uh, what I've kind of given you here is a se our seed points that are located uh, near the middle of the right eye and, uh, and on the more reddish part of the nose. Um, and so you can experiment with any or all of the tools that uh, we've discussed here and, uh, and see what you're able to get. Some of these are, um, some of these are easier than others. The, uh, the nose is easier than the eye, and you can think about why that would be. Um, and I'd be happy to discuss this more with you. So thank you and uh, experiment or uh, take a break. All right, so we're going to change gears a little bit now and um, head over into an advanced workflow example. So this is an example that comes from an actual paper that was published recently. So this was in one of the Nature journals. Um, I've given the link there at the top, and I have to admit I don't know anything about the, the field being studied here or the objects being studied. Or uh, yeah, If you have any technical details, you should ask Juan about it. Um, but yeah, I think this is a nice example of um, how a typical analysis pipeline would work. So all right, so let's start here. Again, just setting up. Oh, this is the advanced workflow example. Yeah, so this in this section, it's not going to be uh, interactive. We won't have any exercises. This is more sort of a, a show and tell, if you will. Right, so uh, we set up matplotlib and numpy again. Um, I'm just I'm adding some settings here to make sure that our figures are nice and big and that the color map is gray by default. And then I load this data set here called uh, diatom wild. So it's an image of a diatom. And yeah, so that's, that's the input image we're going to be working with. Um, and you can see that's a pretty typical output from a scanner. The scanners typically add some you know, banner at the, at the bottom with some metadata. Um, and then the, the gray level image itself. So the first thing we want to do is just strip off that banner at the bottom. So we can do that with a NumPy indexing operation, right? So we could just say, give us all the rows up to about, what do you think? Where does that banner start? Like 690? Yeah, that's, that's good. All right, so we grab from 690, uh, all the rows up to 690 and all the columns. So there we've stripped off the the banner. Right, now what do we want to do with this image? So um, you'll see that there are these little uh, black holes or pores. So what we want to do is quantify these. So we want to identify the holes and then we want to maybe count how many of them they are and we want to see what are their size distributions, for example. So the image uh, has a little bit of noise in it. So just to make sure that the image that we work with is nice and smooth, the first step I'm going to do is apply a median filter. So you saw, um, so Juan described that to you early on. So the median filter is a window that you slide across the image, right? And then at each point, you replace the value in the center with a median of all the surrounding pixels. So basically the value for which you have an equal number of pixels with lower value and higher value. So that tends to get rid of um, speckle noise and that sort of thing quite effectively. Um, I'll adjust the filter so you can see what happens if you apply too much of a median filter. So yeah, the effect is kind of subtle here. You can see it looks very much like our input image. You won't be able to see the difference on the screen here. Maybe on your laptop you can see it. But if I make this maybe a size 51 filter and 
It'll take a while to run. I didn't expect it to take that long to run. Is it gonna finish? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's, that's not helpful. Clearly don't wanna go that far. Uh, let's try maybe 17. Yeah, so you can see um, your image gets sort of this um, smooth, glossy, cartoonish side of um, sort of feeling. But if we go this far, we lose all our pores. So you have to be very careful um, when you pre-process your input data. You don't want to lose any of the attributes that you need to measure in the end. Uh, so any kind of denoising is a little bit risky, but I think a little bit of it is fine. So we'll just do a small mask here, size 3, 3 by 3 window. And... Okay, so we'll work with this image. Now, um, how, what do you recommend? How do we identify these pores? Have you seen anything in this tutorial so far that we might be able to, to use for that? A histogram, and what will the histogram give us? Threshold. A threshold. Right, so a threshold, I mean, th those things look like they're dark splotches. So we think maybe with the threshold, we'll be able to get it um, separated pretty well. So let's see. Um, I'm going to adjust the images gamma a little bit. So in the scikit image exposure submodule, you've got um, the kinds of sliders you would expect to find in Photoshop to make things a little bit brighter, dimmer, um, increase the contrast, and so forth. So I'm just brightening up the, the brighter parts of the image and, and pushing down the darker parts of the image. So we have a nicely stretched contrast there. Um, and yeah, now we'll try and do a threshold on that. Um, this image is quite striking if you, like to the computer, it doesn't matter whether you look at this or the inverse, right? But your eye likes it the other way around. So if I do one minus this image, look what comes out. Look at that thing. I mean, your eye is just immediately like, Phew. yeah, I know what to find there. Um, but right, to the computer, it doesn't really matter. So I picked a threshold of 0.325 here. Um, this really is the weakest point of this whole pipeline is that you have to select this threshold. And that's a problem you'll run into with image processing continually. There's always a, a friggin' knob to tune. And if you don't get the, the knob right, then your pipeline falls apart. Um, but you don't want the human sitting there tuning the knob, so what do you do? So often you have to apply machine learning on top of your problem to learn the knob or you have to use a, a neural net or something like that where um, there is no knob to tweak. All right, but I, I tweak the knob to 0.325 and I get a pretty sensible um, threshold mask over here. So I took all the values less than um, 0.325 and, and this is what comes out. All right, so now um, I also just want to show you what would happen if you tried the automated segmentation uh, thresholding algorithms. So Psychic Image has got a whole bunch of these, like um, Li or Otsu. They can, they can guess what the threshold should be. So they try and do a maximal separation between foreground and background. And if your problem is well suited to it, that's great because you're removing one knob from the equation. In this case, it doesn't really work, um, but often it does. So let's see what that would look like. Okay, so there you see various algorithms. There's ISO data, which looks all right, except there in the corner, you see we have um, regions that start to blend into one another. Li does a little bit better, still some blending. Um, mean is too low. Minimum gives uh, small regions out. Um, or two also doesn't quite grab it. Triangle, definitely not. Um, yen does a reasonable job. But I think my handpicked value is, uh, is better here. Okay, um, at the cost of having that knob. Right, so a very common, I'm gonna show you now a very common strategy that we use for robustly um, segmenting images. Um, you'll run into this into, in our gallery all the time. So the, the rough process we're gonna do is we're gonna look at these white dots, then we're gonna set up a distance map, and the distance map is basically going to tell us um, how far do you have to move to reach the background from, um, from the dots, or if you invert the problem, how far do you have to move from the background to get to one of these dots? 
Um, and then we're going to, that's going to generate some kind of landscape for us. We're going to fill up that landscape with water. And then we're going to look where the different regions of water start to flow into one another. And that will give our, um, the outlines of our different objects. Okay, it's very hand wavy. Let's look at how it looks um, when we actually execute it. Right, so like I said, the first step is to generate this distance map. So this is the distance um, that we have to travel to the background. So we have this thresholded map, and at any white pixel, how, do you, how far do you have to move from that white pixel to get to the background? Well, if you're in the middle of a big white splotch, you have to travel quite far to get to the background. If you're already in the background, you have to travel a distance of zero to get to the background. Um, and the closer you get to the edge of any of my objects, the nearer you are to the background. So you get objects where they used to be just a flat um, area. They sort of tend to drop off as, they, uh, as you go toward the background. So now you've changed this, um, this uh, zero one mask of yours into a much smoother mask, which is handy for the watershed um, that's about to come. Um, like I said, the watershed segmentation algorithm, it requires us to fill up a scenery with water. We need to know where to put our water fountains in the scene. So we're gonna, what we're going to do next is identify the positions of the water fountains <laughs> as the peaks of all of these little white dots you see on the screen. So for that, I use the local maxima function. And I'll plot for you the maxima that we found. There you go. So you can see that this is the original image with the maxima imposed on top. And we did a pretty good job of putting at least one dot down into um, each pore. It's not perfect, especially for the smaller ones onto the side, but reasonable. OK, this is a little utility function that I'll use just now. You can just ignore it for now. Um, all right, so now I, now I execute that, uh, the watershed algorithm. So like I said, it pretends like um, we're operating on our distant, uh, which, which one do I run it on? On our denoised image, yeah. So this is going to become our landscape. The original image is a landscape. Um, the landscape goes down where it's darker and it goes up where it's brighter. So these pores are holes in the landscape. Right? And then at the bottom of each hole, we put down a little fountain, and now we turn on the taps. So the, the pores start filling up with water, and at some point they overflow. And where the waters, where a neighboring pore's water overflows, where the water meets, that's going to be the boundary that we define. Well, let's see how that looks. Uh, All right, so this is where I use that uh, shuffle label algorithm of mine. Um, that's just to make sure that the, um, the labels aren't displayed in sequential order because then you can't really um, distinguish one region from the next. So I just shuffle up the labels to give you this nice jumble. But it, um, you can see that, um, that we now have little regions around each pore. The, one of the reasons we do this is imagine you have two pores that touch one another. Right? So they touch one another, and it would be easy for us to detect that as, as one region, even with our thresholding. Right? We threshold, but now they look like they're, they're one region, even though they're two pores. But if you can put a fountain in each, and you start filling them up, then there where the water meets, it disambiguates these, um, these two pores for us. OK, but there's clearly a problem. We have a segmentation, but now what do we do with that thing? Well. We have to tell the segmentation, you can't just overflow the pore and go running off into the landscape. You have to stop when you get to the edge of the pore. Do we have a map of some sorts that tell us where the edge of the pore could be? Well, yeah, that's the original threshold mask that we generated that tells us pore, not pore. So we're going to uh, repeat this exercise, but we're going to um, add a mask argument to the watershed. And that will tell it, fill up, but don't run any further than, um, than our mask, which will still give us that beautiful disambiguation between touching pores, but it won't run off into the, um, 
into the distance. Okay, so there you see, now we've got a, a map where each pore has been um, segmented out. Um, to visualize that for you, I'm gonna take this map and I'm gonna draw contours on it using the measure.findContours method. And there you go. So that's quite a nice map of, of the contours. You can see that we missed some of the smaller ones there on the side. Um, some of the, I think most of the bigger ones were captured. Um, did, a, did a pretty reasonable job. Okay, so now, um, now that we've got the pores, we want to do some analysis on these pores. How many of them do we have? Uh, what are their shape distributions, for example? So for that, we use region props. And Josh uh, briefly touched on region props. Uh, region props are extremely handy. So it's basically when you have a bunch of um, binary labeled areas in your image, you want to ask questions about these areas. Um, are they elongated? What's, their, what's the direction of the primary and the secondary axis going through them? What's the circumference? What's the area? Um, you know, any, any question you can ask of a shape, you can ask of these things. And what I want to ask is, what's the area for each? And then I want to draw a histogram of that. So I take my, um, my labeled mask, and then I call region props on it. Region props always takes a labeled image as input. So um, just want to make sure everyone understands what I'm saying with that. So if you have a binary mask, um, a labeled version of that mask is just where you take the first object and you say that's number one, second one, number two, third one, number three. So you just paint, paint the, um, the mask with different values, one per object. And that's what goes into region props. Okay, and now here you can see that for each region, I just take its area, <coughs> and then I ask Matplotlib to draw a histogram. Okay, so there you see. Now, you can see that this is a, this is a little bit suspicious, right? Um, I mean, it looks fine, but there are a couple of outliers, like to the big side, and a lot of things that we're not quite sure about on the smaller side. But then there's also like this very sudden ramp and kind of drop down on the higher side. So what's happening there? Well, I suspect that our thresholding algorithm, it imposes a fairly strict limit on, um, on the, the shapes of, of these regions we're identifying. So if you pick your threshold a little bit too high or a little bit too low, um, then you're either not going to capture some of the pores or only capture the bigger ones. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not, again, it's not ideal to have to pick that threshold, but good enough for now. Okay, so in the paper, one of the, um, one of the interesting things they do is they use scikit-image to construct this classic pipeline that I showed to you. And we know this pipeline is flawed, right? It, it works more or less, but it doesn't do the best job it can. Turns out you can train a neural network on a whole bunch of almost correctly labeled inputs. And if you do that enough time, the neural network will uh, start to generalize and will hopefully give you results that outperform your training data. Just because your training data has got errors in them, like when you misclassify or mislabel things. Um, and if you give it enough of that data, it will see that those are outliers and it will give you a model that's better. So that's what they did in the paper. They constructed, uh, constructed this neural network. Um, not going to go into too much details here, but I'm using Keras to reconstruct their network described in the paper. Um, you're starting with a, with a neural network model, you're adding several layers, and then I'm actually grabbing the, the model weights that they saved from their paper and loading it back in. So that just gives us um, their, their neural network in memory. It's called model. All right, so I've constructed their model, and now I'm going to apply their model to, um, to our images. So the way their model works is it basically takes tiles of 64 by 64, and it will give you a mask out for that 64 by 60, uh, sorry, 46 by 46 tile. 
So it, it will do that. So I must take my whole image, split it up into little tiles, 46 by 46 each, uh, pop each tile into the neural network, and it will give me a mask for each. I take the results of all of those and I stitch them back together um, into, into a bigger mask. So that's a lot of moving data around. I mean, you can, the code is here. You can look at it later if you want to see how I did it. Um, but basically, the essence of it is I had to pad the image a little bit so it became divisible by 46 in all the different directions. Um, then I used this view as blocks method in scikit-image to split it up into little blocks. I pushed all that through the neural net, and then I used um, a function we have called montage, which stitches smaller image back, images back into a bigger one. Okay, so let's look, let's look at the output of that. There you can see we call model.predict classes. That's um, asking Keras, asking the neural network, give us the prediction for the various tiles. I stitch the tiles together, and this is what comes out. Okay, so that's the neural network's idea of the best um, mask of poor versus non-poor. So let's plot that with contours like we did for ours. Okay, there we go. So does that look better or worse or better? Why do you think it looks better? The small ones, yes. That, yeah, so the small ones got identified here that we didn't see in the original. So we get the sense that, um, and this is what we would expect from a convolutional net, that it, can, that it has some um, way to handle scale. Um, but then I also see artifacts in here. Like I see weirdly shaped pores, like things that are kind of elongated and probably not pores. So it's not perfect but it gives us a better sense of the scale of things. Right, so again, I can run region props on that mask they generated, and now I can plot histograms for both. And look what you see here. You now see the, in blue, you see the um, histogram for our classic approach, that's uh, over the area, and then for the neural net. So these are the areas of the different pores. Um, what do you notice about the shape of the neural net histogram? in comparison to the blue one. Yeah, it looks, it looks kind of more almost gaussian -y, more smooth. Um, of course, we don't, we don't have any idea of what the distribution of those areas will be, unless you understand the biology. But, you know, the gut, my gut feeling would be like, yeah, something that really ramps up quickly and then sort of jaggedly drops down, there might be an image processing artifact in there. So the fact that it slowly goes up and down uh, it's probably a better representation of the data. Um, yeah, so that's basically the end of this example. Um, I'll just mention to you one further step you could take here. You could take your region props and say, um, you notice that the neural net introduced these funny pore shapes in some places? Well, we can go and remove those, right? So we can go in and say, why don't you measure for each pore uh, identified, whether it looks circular, and if it doesn't look circular, just throw it out, and we'll redo our analysis. Um, so that's what happens in the rest of the notebook. I have a function that defines circularity, um, and I'm not going to go over this in detail, but then when I remove basically all areas that, um, that, don't, that, that don't seem to be circular, then this is the new mask that comes out. And now you can see I got rid of most of the weird um, squigglies. And if I then do my histogram, well, that's the, that's the result that comes out. So I, you can see I filtered out any regions with area less than 24 or something. Um, so that's where you see nothing at the bottom of the spectrum. And then higher up, you get this fairly uh, smooth curve. Yeah. All right, so that gives you an idea of uh, you know, how a typical image processing pipeline might work, <laughs> how you might combine a neural network with scikit-image, either for training or an application, um, and how you could take the result of a neural net and analyze it further uh, with uh, scikit-image. All right. So then to round us up this afternoon, Ransof, uh, Josh will present a brief tour of some scikit-image functions. 
and then uh, we should have a few minutes for Q and A. Yeah, sure. So we're now heading into tour of psychic image. taking just a moment because this is not a small notebook. Um, so scikit image is a large package uh, and we, unlike NumPy, don't have all the functionality of the package at the base namespace. So we've gotten some feedback in the past that um, discoverability could be um, a little bit better and it's just not possible for us to introduce every piece of the package to you in four hours. Um, not possible to do it in eight hours. I mean, this it really covers the uh, extent of things which would usually be taught um, over the course of about a year in a grad school. So, um, as a bridge to help uh, the discoverability, um, this notebook is designed as uh, a tour through the submodules of Scikit Image. So this table of contents has live links which go to the various um, cells uh, down further in the actual um, notebook that pertain to what that, that particular submodule of the package is. And then it talks about what, that, so what the sort of core reason for that um, submodule's existence is. And uh, some of them include uh, example um, tutorials with some room for you to explore and experiment. Um, and uh, there may be links out to the, the example gallery, which, for example, um, this one will get you to the exposure and color area of our example gallery. And so you can continue um, exploring that way. So the real goal for this is to sort of um, have something that you can take with you or anyone else um, the, here in the tutorial or, or elsewhere. Uh, potentially watching this on YouTube later, um, can, can look through and sort of get a sense of, oh, okay, so this might be useful for me, this is why that's there, um, <coughs> and, uh, and the like. So in the brief amount of time, I've got a little over 10 minutes for this, um, we can kind of just run down the submodules of Scikit Image, some of which you've already seen, some of which we've gone into or touched on at various depths uh, this afternoon. So color, the main purpose of color is to um, convert to and from either different color spaces, as one, uh, sorry, as Stefan mentioned, red, green, and blue, RGB, um, is the one that I think we all know and love, but there are many other uh, representations out there, and essentially um, you can convert RGB into any of these options, for example. Um, so there's many other, you know, from lab to uh, HSV and then some um, less, uh, some more esoteric options as far as color spaces go. Um, and then you can bring those back. So you can go, um, and then you can get them back. So RGB back from these various others different, uh, other different, um, color spaces. So if you need to do any color conversions, color is your friend. Um, and then at the, at the bottom of each of these little subsections, um, and if you run these, you'll see a, a cup that's converted to um, from RGB to see the individual hue and value channels from it. Um, and then you can actually work further with that and do other things. But uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to kind of give you a, a uh, 9,000 foot overview, or 9,001 foot overview, potentially. Um, so back to the table of contents, just takes us right back to the top. Uh, Skimage.data, you've seen uh, some of the images that are in there uh, through the course of the tutorial today. Chelsea, uh, Stefan's cat, the astronaut, uh, example text, and there are multiple other images in there, some from scientific uh, disciplines or subdisciplines, some that are standard <coughs> test images from the literature, and uh, I think there's also a stereoscopic image in there. Um, <coughs> Skimage.draw is all about drawing primitives on an image. Um, so simple things like lines, polygons, circles um, are available here. The majority of these um, actually give you back a mask. They don't actually directly change the image. 
and then you can either um, index the image you would like to change and set those equal to whatever you would like, or you can use the set color as a convenience function to sort of change your image down, uh, the, the, the pieces of the image to draw those shapes uh, into what you would like. Um, and you can explore the namespace of draw by just tab completing here once you have imported that sub-module. And, uh, and you can see what's available. And a couple of these also have anti-aliased options, um, which uh, aren't just hard black and white. They'll give you uh, partial values around uh, just a little more of a pleasant uh, result. So there's examples for that. And we can go back to the table of contents. Um, exposure. Stevan's talked to you a little bit about this, sort of uh, changing the overall exposure of an image. Um, it also includes the histogram. Um, NumPy has a histogram. There is a hist uh, that's included in matplotlib. But if you use R's, it actually gives you back a result that respects the number of bins that you would expect to see in your data. So if you give it a UN8 image where you would usually expect to have 256 bins, NumPy is going to bin that down to 16 or 32 actual individual bins, and that's not as meaningful for you um, as because uh, you've got plenty of pixels, so it's not like you really need to do the rebinning. Um, so the standard image processing is mostly to keep the actual individual discrete pixel values, and so what you'll get from this is actually 256 bins by default instead of needing to change that as the option. Um, also things like histogram equalization, which can be uh, quite useful. Um, in uh, basically taking an image that might not have been perfectly exposed, it's kind of got like a veil of gray, everything's gray in it, just a little bit like a foggy morning. Um, and uh, you can turn that in by stretching the histogram a little bit via various functions here um, into something that looks more like it's properly exposed and uh, more properly extends from the range from like zero to uh, the maximum, let's say that was 256. Uh, so fixing the exposure of images is in exposure. Feature um, has a number of things in it, and I've kind of broken them down by uh, a number of different options that you can do. So this is, a, um, this is an area that's a, of particular interest, sorry, moved around there, feature, here we go, um, in the package. So you can do edge detection and um, with the canny edge detector, which is kind of uh, thought of as state of the art for edge detection, but only in 2D. That algorithm is not defined in 3D. Um, and then there's a number of corner detections, blob detections, uh, texture features, which you can extract and play with. The majority of these have examples um, in our example gallery, and I didn't copy all of them in because it's a big, um, it's a big uh, sort of subdomain. Um, <coughs> I, you can also find peaks and uh, do feature matching, which I think is what I actually did include here was the feature matching um, as a way to try and determine interesting features in one image and then in that same image, but it's been modified, maybe it's been flipped around or, or different, and now we're going to try and find a mapping between those two. Um, it's useful for things like registration. Moving on. Um, there's filters, which Juan has uh, talked about some of these. We've heard about Sobel. That's only one of several edge filters that is in uh, skimage.filters. So we also have a number of other ones. Um, there are ridge filters, which are uh, often used for in medicine to find things like um, vessels and nerves. And um, <clears throat> there's some directional filtering. The ability to uh, blur or denoise, we talked about Gaussian filtering and median filtering today. Um, you can also go the other direction and sharpen things. Um, and uh, there's an ability for you to actually define your own filter in here. Um, so there's some examples there, but that was, that was filters. Um, when I, oh yeah, and filters also has a sub -mod, sub sub module actually called the rank filters, um, which are nonlinear and only look at small areas of the image. So the rest, almost all the rest of the, those filters are whole image things. We're looking at all, all of it together. The rank filters are going to look at only around the actual uh, pixel or voxel of interest. Uh, they're only going to look right there and then tell you something about it. So you can do a local median filter, a local maximum filter, a local minimum filter. You can look at the entropy, the number of bits that would be required to actually represent this small subregion. 
Uh, that's the rank filters, which we had not previously mentioned, but they are quite useful. Um, future, I mentioned in my tutorial, um, we're basically it's just a place for things to briefly be in between releases before they have a final API and they move in. So it's stable and robust code. You might interact with it slightly differently in the future if you decide to explore it. Um, Skimage.graph uh, contains graph theory and minimum cost paths. Um, and then there's also that region adjacency graph that I showed you that's in future at the moment. Um, their panorama tutorial has a pretty good example of um, using uh, the graph submodule to define an ideal way to stitch images together. Um, we talked about the IO module, so that's how you get images in and out. Um, Measure region props is the one that I really want to bring to your attention here uh, again because it includes the ability, whoops, uh, it lets you determine many, many different properties of subregions that you have already labeled. And I apologize, I'm going quickly. Uh, you get the idea, so you can peruse, peruse the rest of this uh, worksheet kind of at your at your leisure. Um, morphology, we didn't really go into today. There is an entire lecture that's based on that in the tutorial repository if you'd like to peruse that. Um, but it's nonlinear, unlike the filters, and it all result, uh, is changes in the very local image vicinity um, to try and either remove dark... <coughs> like salt and pepper noise, it, it can remove that very nicely, um, and also do things like skeletonization. So if you'd like to take um, a path and reduce it down to its minimum necessary single pixel path, you can do that. You can thin the path down um, with routines that are in skimage.morphology. This is a long example that goes through the key uh, morphology techniques. Um, restoration is a very interesting submodule that includes deconvolution. So this is basically the, the conceptual uh, example for deconvolution is something that has negatively affected an entire image and it's all affected the same way. So um, the canonical example that I like to think of is correcting like a, um, a lens problem. So you had a lens problem. Uh, let's say the Hubble had a lens problem, and you're able to get usable images out perhaps because you've modeled exactly what that lens problem was, and it's treated all the photons incorrectly the same way, and if you deconvolve that, you can actually almost think about it like you subtract that effect out and, and completely remove it. Uh, but you have to know a bit about the system to, in order to do that uh, via conventional approaches, or you can do an unsupervised, where it tries to approximate what's wrong and then subtract it. It tries to find something that is systematically wrong with the entire image and then get rid of it. <coughs> so that's a very interesting technique. In painting is, um, is like um, when you're filling an area in Photoshop and it's making up pixels out of nowhere based on the surroundings. Um, and so we've got one current algorithm for that and a couple of others that I think are in the, uh, the PR pipeline because that's an interesting thing to have. Um, I think we're just about done here. Segmentation I think I talked about and won't uh, belabor any further. Transform lets you do fun things like make a swirl in the middle of an image as well as much more useful things like um, Register images uh, with potentially a new API that's coming soon and uh, and warp an image, uh, move it, uh, to rotate it. Um, all those kind of effects are in transform. Um, there are also things that are a little more domain specific, like the radon transforms, which are useful for medical image processing. And then utility functions exist in uh, skimage.util. Um, Standouts include random noise, so if you need a particular type of noise added to your image um, in a random or quasi-random way, that pretty much has all the, uh, all the necessary pieces are in that function. Um, and then padding and cropping images are things that come up quite frequently. Padding is now inbuilt into uh, NumPy, and so we just wrap np.pad. But uh, cropping, I don't think, is built into NumPy. So if you need to crop an image back down, there it is, and there's some uh, other utility functions that allow you to um, potentially make your workflow more efficient. Um, and that's the amount of time that I had. <coughs> All right. All right. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. That uh, that brings us to the conclusion of the material we have prepared for today. Um, 
so we have uh, we have a few more minutes. Um, if you have any any questions, um, yeah, maybe five minutes, just quick quick Q and A before we head out for the afternoon. Um, we'll start us off. Yeah, yeah, we have a constant drive to um, like Psychic Image started out as a two D only library, and um, about two years ago. I think we realized like, whoa, yeah, we really need to focus more on ND. So that's been, it's been a focus and we've been systematically going through and everything that we can, we've, and new algorithms are all implemented um, ND wherever possible. So I think you'll see more of that coming. Brandon Walker is, flood fill is fully in uh, yeah. 3D and ND respectively. Uh, I think some of the super pixel algorithms are not. Slick is 3D, not ND. So there's an example in the, um, so we didn't, there's a lot of lecture material in the repository that we didn't get to today, but there's a three-dimensional example that's linked from the uh, front page. Um, sure. So that one might, might be worth checking out. It's a, a, a cell volume where we segment out the different cells and then visualize them. Uh, one thing that I want to point out is that you're all welcome to contribute to Psychic Image. Uh, so when I came to SciPy 2012, I hadn't contributed to open source at all, and then uh, I sat with Stefan in the sprints uh, on Saturday, uh, to which you should all come, um, and started making my own contributions. Um, and that's part of where Psychic Image is today, is by getting users to contribute the, the stuff that they need. So if ever you, you know, hit some words in Psychic Image that you think, I think I can improve this, or I could do better, then get in touch. There's links at the bottom of the of the index um, for how to do that. We should phrase it as a warning. If you come to the sprints, you might be with us seven years from now. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, the, uh, Psyched Image is now 10 years old, so it's been, it's been a decade of, of work that we've put into that, so we're excited to reach that milestone. All right, well, uh, feel free to talk to us afterwards. Uh, we're also around the conference uh, until Sunday. We're on Twitter um, on the Psychic Image mailing list. So, yeah, we look forward to talking to you about your image processing problems. Thank you for your attention and for attending. <laughs>